about Davy Aguilera's failure to conduct an investigation during the period of August to November of 1992. I have not spoken to Special Agent Aguilera about that, and I understand he may be a witness later on. But based on my experience, I'll tell you what the answer is. Uh, during this period of time, Mr. Aguilera works for an agency that's assigned to Treasury Department. Those of us who are in law enforcement know that Treasury Department, from about midsummer until November, is tied up in the campaigns. That's their main function. They borrow from customs, they borrow from ATF, they borrow from Internal Revenue Service, they get as many special agents as they can to augment their Secret Service. I would be willing to surmise, and that's what it is at this point, but I would be willing to surmise that Mr. Aguilera will answer that, that particular, that the, the reason that he could not conduct any investigation at the time. It is not, though, or the risk is, the danger is, is that it's, it's a basis on which someone has formed an opinion, and then based upon that opinion, they start to scour the record looking for evidence that will support that opinion. And that's what I hope and I feel this, this uh, panel will steer away from in this particular regard. Uh, for instance, the other gentleman made some comment about how this was an ordinary religious movement out there at Mount Carmel. Uh, I beg to differ with you. My hair stood on end when I read the interviews of five and six-year-old children that came out of Mount Carmel knowing how to commit suicide, knowing to put a gun barrel in their mouth and blow the top of their heads off. That is not the ordinary religious doctrine. That is not what we were dealing with. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to try to share with you some of our opinions that we came to over this period of time. And the first opinion, I pr we prepared a joint statement, which I'd like to ask to be submitted and made part of the record. But our first opinion was basically that the Branch Davidians were not coming out. That was a decision that was based or an opinion that, that came to be uh, held by virtually everyone uh, as of the middle part of April of 1993. The tragedy that's involved here actually began back in 1992 when, when David Koresh makes his prediction, moving his timetable initially from 95 up to Passover 93. In the Passover season of 1992, this is based on our witnesses' testimonies, he predicted that that was going to be the last Passover, that sometime during the year of 1992 to 1993, the confrontation with the beast, which in this regard he personified as the government of the United States, had to occur. That was his theology. It was based upon his theology. The, the followers were there. They believed in David Koresh. They believed his teachings, as, he, as every survivor who testified, testified to, that Koresh meant death. They followed that particular belief. They were there to die. They were there to die, and according to Koresh, they were either going to die by bullet, they were going to die by fire, they were going to die by tank, or if they were fortunate, they would be translated to heaven without having to go through the agony of death. But the one message that he taught, and this again was testified to by the three survivors who testified on behalf of the United States, was in order to show your worthiness to go to heaven, you had to be willing to kill. You could not die for God if you could not kill for God. And in the words of one of the survivors, there were no conscientious objectors at, at Mount Carmel. We were prepared to prove, but the court excluded it for the reasons I'll tell you in a second, of an instruction and a plan that David Koresh discussed with his followers. And this was what we call the McDonald's plan. And in that, he encouraged them to go out in the community in order to force a confrontation with law enforcement, to go out in the community, take over a public facility, a McDonald's, or if you recall, there was an incident in Colleen involving a Luby's cafeteria, take over a facility take the people inside hostage, hold them at gunpoint, and force them to admit that David Koresh was the Lamb of God. If they refused, he encouraged and directed his followers to do so, to kill them if they refused. It, it was our opinion that what he was trying to do here was to force a confrontation with law enforcement authorities. He later backed off on that. He later came back and said, well, it was just a test. And of course, if any of you are familiar with Jonestown and the actions of Jim Jones, that's what he did to condition his followers uh, to take the, the poison suicide, uh, cyanide, was to go through these tests of it's time to commit suicide, it's time to impose these things, drink the suicide and die. He also, during the same period of time, and you'll hear from this witness, uh, he testified to our, and told an outsider who was there examining the child abuse allegations, he told her that when I reveal myself, my true identity, the riots in Los Angeles will pale by comparison. This is right after they headed the major riots in Los Angeles. We were also prepared to prove through the testimony of witnesses 
that even, even when that lady came to make her, her interviews, the Branch Davidians had intentionally kept away from her the small children who were David's children. They did not want to see the 15 or 16 uh, children that ran around at about the same age that were David's children because they were afraid that if they did, they would start questioning the ages of their mother. Indeed, one of the plans that we had in the event that we had been successful in obtaining David Koresh's arrest was to take DNA samples from him and from his children to prove that he had been having sex with minor children and then to submit that to the state so the state could prosecute him for being the child, a child molester. We established that David Koresh intended to have a confrontation. That's what he was after. He was going to have a confrontation sometime between Passover of 1992 and Passover of 1993, and unfortunately, it was ATF who stumbled into that intent. Unfortunately, it was ATF who arrived on February 28th to, to initiate or execute a lawful search warrant, and instead, Koresh had 45 minutes warning, had a notice that they were coming, and spent that 45 minutes, instead of preparing to, to surrender or to arrange his resident counsel, he had a lawyer inside the building with him, to arrange his surrender, he spent that time preparing, preparing to, to resist the agents. There's some surmise concerning uh, helicopters and whether or not the helicopter shot at uh, the, the Davidian compound that day. We presented the testimony of Mr. Maloney. Uh, I know Mr. Rebus wasn't there during the course of the testimony, and he had to go back and read Mr. Maloney's testimony. Mr. Maloney was quite clear using a map that what he was talking about was not the first intersection, but he was talking about being in a location some mile behind the compound, back behind the hills. This is a very hilly area. And then beyond that, seeing the helicopter circling. And that was perfectly consistent with the testimony of the citizen soldiers of the Texas National Guard who were flying those helicopters that day, that they did some distance away, some miles away, orbit because they were trying to wait for the time factor. They did not realize that the, the, the rate had been moved up. There was no testimony from any pilot or any person on board those helicopters of any gunfire, but more significantly, there were videotapes that were made from those helicopters, and they were delivered to defense counsel, and they were paid, played for the purpose of the jury. There is no evidence, no sound of any gunfire coming from any of those helicopters. Indeed, you can hear the bullets striking the helicopter but you can't hear the bullet, any sound of any gunfire going out of those helicopters. With this kind of mindset was also confirmed the fact that there was a suicide pact within Mount Carmel. This was something that wasn't discussed that much in the press, but every survivor testified concerning that suicide pact. And basically what the design was or what the plan was was that David Koresh thought he was dying. He thought that wound that he received on February 28th was so severe that he was going to die and when he died, his followers were going to come with him. When he died, they were going to put his body on a, on a stretcher. They were going to come outside with their women and their children. The mighty men, the, the men that were the loyal to him, were going to be carrying his children. They were going to have guns and hand grenades concealed. They were going to pull those guns and hand grenades and open fire on the FBI, thereby forcing the FBI to fire back. A suicide by cop, exactly what it was, trying to force the FBI in front of the world press to be humiliated, to be criticized for shooting women and children and shooting, shooting people that were there uh, at Mount Carmel. And then if that failed, they were going to kill themselves. They even went around selecting their friends as to who was going to be the person that was going to kill you. They went around and rehearsed how they did it. This, again, is based upon the testimony. They went around and rehearsed how to do it. How many people can die on a hand grenade? Should we have three of us or should we have four of us standing around when the hand grenade is pulled? Who's going to pull the pin? That was the degree of rehearsal. It got to the point where they finally even got down to say goodbye to each other. They gathered in the cafeteria on about March the 2nd or 3rd. They had religious services to the extent they had. They sang songs. David all of a sudden sent out messages. He was feeling better. And that's when the message came that God said to wait. Now, no witness testified that God was told him that he was going to surrender. All he told him to do was wait. There was never any testimony that God, David Koresh intended to surrender. Likewise, during the 51 days of the siege, there was never any indication that David Koresh was going to surrender. There was more negotiations, hundreds of hours of negotiation tapes, all of which have been released to the public. There were hundreds of hours of Title III, and I understand now that the Department of Justice has obtained, finally obtained a court order that permits those to be released to the public. Those indicate that there was no intention to surrender. The only people who came out of Mount Carmel during the 51 days were people that David Koresh sent out. He selected 
for various reasons to go out. An example, Kathy Schroeder, the lady who, who made a deal with us and testified on our behalf. Her, she was sent out because she was a sinner. When David Koresh was weak, she had smoked cigarettes, she had drunk alcohol, and, and when he got his powers back, when we recovered his powers, he became incensed over that. He called her in and he told her. He'd already sent her children out. They were going to stay in the world and not go to heaven. And he told her, you've been such a sinner that you're going to interfere with my chances to get these, the, my followers into heaven. And so therefore, I'm going to send you out and you're going to stay here while I die. <clears throat> and then once I die, then I'll come back and get you. But because of that, because I can't risk your sin jeopardizing my mission, I'm going to send you out. That's the reason that the, the negotiators, no matter what they thought, never could understand why they couldn't get more. And the reason they couldn't get more was that the, any time they got something, it was because David Koresh decided they were going to give them to him. Uh, the Branch Davidians started the fire. We proved so conclusively that the Branch Davidians started the fire that two, at least two defense counsel conceded it during closing argument. We proved it through direct testimony of, of uh, experts. We through, proved it through uh, a multiple type of experts, uh, fire marshals from all over the nation that did an investigation, a uh, PhD professor who you'll hear from, watch his tape, it's a great tape, uh, who, who came up with a fire analysis. We proved it through the scientific evidence showing the scattering of fuel throughout the compound. We proved it through the Tidal Threes. They were the ones that were heard on Nightline the other day. Mr. Rebus, I think, describes them as being murky. I'll be truthful to you. I heard it. I heard it the first time I heard listening to it. If you didn't hear it, go back and listen to Nightline again. You can hear the instructions, even through the, the gas mask, even though it was too difficult to hear on April the, 18th, uh, April the 19th. When you go back now and listen to it, you can hear the instructions. You can hear, spread the fuel. Have we spread the fuel yet? Have we saved some? Where you can also hear some of the passages where you say, we set the fires when the tanks come in. This was the, the type of evidence and the degree of evidence that we used to affirm or to prove those particular matters. And then lastly, of course, it was confirmed by the presence of the forward-looking infrared camera that was located on the plane above. This is another area where we have myths that grow. One of the myths is, well, the FBI must have known there would be a fire or else they wouldn't have put that camera up there. This operation started in the dark. This operation started before sunrise. That camera was up every night during the 51 days. It would circle. It would make those photographs. It would follow that particular area, and they were trained observers. What better choice to the FBI than to leave that camera up there, even though it did go into the daylight? Not because they, they thought a fire was going to start, but merely because they wanted the extra set of eyes that were up above. What about the, the, the still pictures that were taken from the, cam from the uh, plane of above? Take a look at those. Examine them. It shows where the tanks were. It shows how far they went inside. Uh, one of Mr. Uh, Rebus's uh, suggestions is that the boom operator, the tank operator, went in and knocked against that bunker that you see on the... The, la the later portions and knock down some, some stones and kill the people inside. Uh, outrageous. Uh, the boom operator completely ignores the testimony of the operator. A Marine Corps a veteran who was trained in the Marine Corps to operate this very vehicle, who very carefully goes inside and never goes through. Look at the floor plan, even in Mr. Revis's book. There's a room, a hall, a room, and then the bunker. Never goes past that very first room. Never penetrates beyond that first room in order to inject the tear gas in there and to open up the various uh, uh, sides of the wall. And one thing you need to remember on that, too, the testimony of all the survivors that came out, all but two, two did not, but all but two of those survivors came out through holes that had been made in the walls by the FBI tanks. Uh, two came out windows, but the rest of them came out through those holes. That was part of the reasoning behind it. There was testimony as to what the reasoning was, why that operator used his skill to go in there and open up that particular area, and it was to open up the area. It was to, to provide an escape route. Uh, this is the kind of, of myth that we're concerned about, and this is the kind of myth that, that Leroy and I would like to be here. Uh, we also established, for instance, that, that the survivors that came out, their clothes smelled of accelerants. They smelled of... of uh, diesel fuel, they smelled of lantern fuel, they smelled of, of lighter fluid, and then the laboratory later came back and confirmed uh, that they had done it. Uh, there was more suggestion or surmise that there's some sinister purpose of the tank coming down near where the bunker is. If you'll see some, some later film, there's a, a picture of the tank down there with his blade out. That ignores, again, the testimony of the operator who testifies concerning why he was there and what he was there for. He knew 
that he was in danger. He knew that if that building fell over in him, he was, yeah. yes, sir. Your, your time has expired. If you could kind of wrap I'm sorry, up. Your Honor. Uh, sorry, Thank Mr. You. Chairman, I didn't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we submitted our, our other matters in there, and, and I think the most important thing to remember is that Leroy and I, to the extent that we can speak for anyone, speaks for the hundreds of law enforcement persons, state, person, local, and national, whose lives have been affected by this matter, who are not the beast. They're not, out to, to they're not out to inflict any damage. They're not out to injure anyone. They're your brothers and your sisters and your mothers and your fathers and your sons and your daughters. And let's not forget that during Thank the next few days. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, we have a, a, a problem here. You've been hearing some bells. Um, we have two votes pending, maybe three. And the process means that one will be for 15 minutes, which we're going to immediately move out to do. There may be two five-minute votes after that. The procedure is it will recess until five minutes after that series of votes. So if you'll be patient, I appreciate that. We look forward to uh, uh, asking all the panel their questions. Recess. Thank you. We'll recess till five minutes after these series of votes. This is the first day of coverage of Waco hearings before the House Government Oversight and Judiciary Committees. We'll continue testimony in a moment. But first, some program information. America Online subscribers can participate in a computer chat room with Republican Senator Thad Cochran of Mississippi. Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. If you're connected to AOL, you'll find the chat room using the keyword C-SPAN. If there's a public affairs event in your area you think we should cover, call the C-SPAN events line. Our telephone number is area code 202-626-7963. You can also fax us at area code 202-737-6226 or contact us by email. Your message should include as much information about the event as possible. The name and phone number of a contact person would be appreciated. Follow proceedings in the House and Senate with our 1995 Congressional Directory. It includes biographies of members, committee assignments, and information about C-SPAN programs. The cost of the guide is $12.95, including shipping and handling. To order, write C-SPAN Publications, 1616 Main Street, Lynchburg, Virginia, 24504, or call 1-800-523-3174. We continue now with the first day of Waco hearings before the House Government Oversight and Judiciary Committee. A note, 45 minutes into this portion, there is some graphic testimony. Subcommittees, please come to order. The uh, procedure that we're going to use here on questions that uh, the subcommittee and committee chairs and ranking minority members will each have five minutes to ask questions. And the chair will uh, begin. Mr. Uh, Revis, is that pronounced that right? Is it Revis or Revis? Revis. Revis. Um, let me just, uh, just ask you, uh, you've been researching this project since 1993, two years. Um, and what do you believe, and this is a real easy one, but just in, in 30 seconds or less, what would you believe the most important thing we can do to pull in these hearings to, to, uh, that would come out of all these hearings? I think the most important thing would be if you could declassify or give to the public and the press all of the documents that we haven't been able to get at. If, for example, all of the Raiders gave statements to the Texas Rangers. 
Uh, the federal prosecution has those statements. Nobody will turn them loose. Um, I have to admit we've had some trouble also. I, I understand you all have. So first of all would be the documents that exist. They shouldn't be kept secret. It's been two years. There's no longer any good reason for that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yan, the, uh, just a couple of questions. When you were prosecuting the surviving Davidians, am I correct that uh, in addition to what you have already testified to, that you charged 11 of them with murder? That's correct. And 11 with aiding and abetting murder? A conspiracy to murder and then, and then the actual aiding and abetting the murder itself. And 10 were using or, or carrying a firearm in the, in the commission of a violent crime? I, I'm going to accept your word of that, Chairman. I, I don't remember the exact number on that. But a pro approximately, approximately 10? Yes, sir. Okay. And is it true that Davidian stated that they were acting in self-defense? That was a charge that was given to the jury, but there was no evidence to support that charge. There is was no that evidence that they were afraid of ATF as far as being physically afraid that a particular ATF was going to fire at them or anything like that. The court bent over backwards and gave them right. a, a self-defense charge. But, but they basically, that was, their, that was their basis. I mean, they said that they were acting in, it is true that they were acting in self-defense. That, that was one of their defensive right. claims, yes, sir. Is it true that no Davidian was convicted on the counts mentioned? That they were not on the murder and the conspiracy murder, that's correct, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted just uh, to ask you that um, during the days immediately after the ATF raid, a shooting review is conducted, which uh, involved asking questions of all ATF agents involved. And at some point, that review turns into questions that could produce information that's helpful to understanding exactly what happened. The Texas Rangers state, and I'll refer you to Treasury Bates number 14137, that you, Mr. Yan, wanted the review cut off. And I guess my question is, is why would you uh, of all people want to cut off a process that was designed to get at the truth. I think that was a mistake, uh, Mr. Chairman. I didn't come on board until April the 1st. And it's my understanding that, that there was a decision made to stop the Treasury review and let the Rangers do all the, all the investigation and gather their information. But I think that was a mistake on the report because I had no, no one consulted me about cutting off a Treasury review. Uh, so I, I think that might have been a mistake. Now, if perhaps they talked to the U.S. Attorney who was who was on the case prior to April the 1st. Do you think any, do you have any knowledge of any other federal prosecutors uh, cutting that off? No, not direct knowledge, no. But I would say perhaps they talked to Mr. Edder. That's the only thing I could think of. Okay. Um, let me move on to another question. Um, let's see. On, um, we found a set. We had thousands and thousands of pieces of paper that, to, to go through, and many, much of it was very well, very unorganized. I found a set of handwritten notes that looks to me to be from someone at the Treasury Department. They read as follows. 1.20 p.m. per Tony, Ray Yan advises us to tell Ron Noble not to open the envelope from Houston Chronicle. Contents are from illegal intercept. Lock in safe and keep. DOJ researching possible violation by paper for printing and distributing. I couldn't help but be intrigued by what this Waco-related note means. Could you shed some light on what was in this mysterious envelope and why Ron Noble could not open it and why was it being locked in the safe? Yes, sir. We, we subpoenaed and obtained from Mr. Maloney, the TV uh, cameraman, or actually I believe it was the other one, his total tape. On his total tape, they had a scanner that was scanning uh, cellular phones, which is probably an illegal interception of those cellular phone telephone conversations. If we had permitted that to be circulated around, that would have been in itself illegal in terms of spreading it around, even letting Mr. Noble listen to what his agents were monitored saying, that in itself would be illegal. So we, we stopped the spreading until we could edit out those portions of the illegally seized cellular phones. That investigation was referred to justice, and I don't know what they ever did in terms of, of whether or not that constituted a, a w illegal wiretap by the press or not. I don't know what the, the final outcome of that was. If, if all, this is the last one, this is a quick one. If you knew all the bad things about David Koresh, why, was, why didn't you uh, arrest him in town? Well, I, I wasn't there. I didn't come on until April the 1st. I, I think what you need to do is address that question to Mr. Aguilera, who's going to be here, and Mr. Johnson, who will. There's no obligation, once the warrant is issued, there's really no obligation to do it as a matter of judgment. 
and, and we're willing to admit there were some mistakes made in judgment in this okay. particular matter. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like the chair now yields to my friend Karen Thurman, the ranking minority member from Florida. Good afternoon. Um, Revis, you keep talking about these documents. Can you give me a better sense, since you'd like us to ask a question on this, of what it is and what documents it is that you're still looking for? I saw your um, interview on TV the other morning that had suggested that now, since then, you've gotten the tapes. I guess since the trials, you were given tapes from the FBI. What other documents is it that you're still requiring? Okay, the, the tapes, as you call them, I got transcripts of those tapes. And I got them through a process that I think was irregular. An attorney named Joe Turney, who had got them for discovery, gave them to me. No one has yet been able to get a copy of those from the FBI through Freedom of Information Act. Though about two weeks ago, the FBI put a set in its Washington office, and you can go in during working hours and look at them. So they've been declassified to the Washington, D.C. press, which doesn't help us a lot in Dallas. Uh, but in particular, the documents I just mentioned were these. After the February 28th raid, the Texas Rangers interviewed all of the raiders, took a statement from each of them, typed it up, and we have only seen about 20 of these statements from those raiders who the prosecution thought it might call as witnesses in the trial. I tried to get the other 60 statements, for example, from the Texas Rangers. They told me I'd have to sue to get them. Um, let me think what else. Could, could, they, could there be a reason why? Um, maybe Mr. Yan is a counselor. I'm not, I, like you, I am not an attorney. I can tell you the attorney. reasons they've given me. They say that there's a lawsuit and that they don't want to complicate that litigation. And my assessment of that is that if the owner of the Watergate building had sued Richard Nixon, and we would have let him say, gee, there's a lawsuit. I can't give you any documents. History would be much different than it is today. Mr. Young, would you like to respond to that? I know there's a billion dollars worth of lawsuits filed against the United States. And there are exceptions under the Freedom of Information Act, uh, exceptions that are granted by this Congress to, to exclude the discovery of those items that would compromise litigation, pending litigation. That's the reason until the criminal trial was over, there was virtually no discovery whatsoever. Since that time, I know Ms. Reno has given instructions to make as much as possible, but again, because of the fiscal limitations on manpower and, and duplication and copying and everything, there's a big backlog on, F, on FOIA requests. Uh, I was told that, that this normal, this delay, what she's meeting, is just a normal delay because of all the other people who have come in ahead of him filing their requests, and they have to be processed. You take out informants' names. You take out the names of people that were promised uh, confidentiality. You take out... Uh, privileged sources, and then you turn it over at the end. And that's it's just a normal process. There's no effort to conceal anything. In fact, Mr. Rebus, if he had called me and asked me uh, some information, he, he prints in there that I was involved in the decision making to, to, to inject the cure gas, and that's totally false. Uh, if he had given me the courtesy of calling me, I would have told him, no, sir, I wasn't involved in the decision making to inject the tear gas. Uh, so it's, it's not a question of trying to hide something. It's simply a question that the, we operate under the rules that Congress imposes on us. I can tell you during the crime bill, everybody in the world wanted a copy of the crime bill. We couldn't get it to everybody either, so you know, we kept having problems. Um, Mr. Rivas, in, on page 14 of your book, you talk about um, the fact that the main premises of your book is that the press did not investigate the events at Waco and that only you really understand these events. Could you kind of describe for us how your findings differ from the rest of the reports uh, who, or the reporters who have covered this story? First of all, I want to say thanks for reading my book. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> I'm always glad it's my to meet job. someone who does. Uh, what happens to the press during that time, and I think most of its members will admit this to you now, is that their budgets got spent during the 51 days. The search warrant, for example, was sealed for most, if not all, of that period. So the press couldn't even find out what it was that David Koresh was supposed to have done. It had to take the, the word of spokesman for it. After those 51 days were over, I went down and, for example, ran into the transcripts of all the telephone calls from Mount Carmel to the FBI. And for a year, I had those, and I told people I had them, and nobody wanted them. 
The biggest surprise I encountered in writing this book is that I had no competitors. And naturally, my conclusions differ, or my questions differ, because I learned a lot more than they did because they abandoned the story when the building burned down. Now, of course, there were some who didn't abandon it quite as quickly as others, but in general, this represents a major, major failure of the press in our country. Mr. One, another question that has been kind of surrounding this has been um, about whether Koresh was having sex with girls um, as young as 12 and 13 years old. What evidence is there that Koresh was having sex with children? We were ready to present testimony of, of for instance, the midwife who had given birth to some of the, some of the young girls. Uh, we, we felt so strongly that, like I said, it was our our plan to take his DNA upon uh, leaving the compound and take the DNA of the children and prove it up. Uh, we just basically, even I've, I've even heard Catherine Manson, the, one of the ladies that was mentioned, the survivor that came out, she was interviewed on the Waco paper and she admitted uh, one, of the, one of the girls was 14 years old when she gave birth to, uh, to one of David's children. So it was, it was a kind of a, a secret, but it wasn't a very closely held secret from within, within the members of the message. Thank you. I now recognize this, uh, <clears throat> Chairman uh, McCollum of Florida. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Yon, I want to ask a question of you. Uh, first, with regard to the trial itself in terms of testimony, was there any testimony at the trial about ATF officers carrying firearms while they were in helicopters on the day of the raid? Yes, that they were carrying firearms and that they had been cleared, that the, the rules were that they could not have a round in the, the chamber, and that was the, the rule that the pilots operated under as they flew toward the area. What uh, was Kathy Schroeder's testimony at trial relevant to the helicopters and firearms? She was on the front side of the building and she didn't have any, any personal knowledge, any direct knowledge. That was her testimony at yes. the trial itself? Yes, well, that's, that's my re if she was even asked, uh, that would have been her answer. I, I'm, I can't remember now whether or not she was even asked because she was. She was at the front side of the building during the whole time of the, of the transaction. Well, we just had a lot of conflicting testimony about helicopters, as you know, and I wanted to find out what had come out of the trial. Mr. Revis, uh, you have stated in your book uh, and in a couple of the comments that you made here uh, quite a bit about the aftermath of the siege, or I should say aftermath of the, the 28th of February, the siege and the fire itself. You didn't get to testify much about that today, but Mr. Jan made a big point, as I gathered from his testimony, that there was a lot of planning going on and that David Koresh never intended to surrender. As I recall, you've got some indication that David Koresh would have surrendered right along. I'm sure you sat there with me listening to Mr. Jan's testimony and I wondered if you could respond to us what your, uh, your investigation unearthed and why, if you do disagree with Mr. Jan on that point, why you disagree. My Mr. Jan said this morning that there was never any testimony about Koresh planning to surrender and nothing in the tapes or transcripts. In the transcripts on the 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th of April, the 18th as well, there's discussion between Steve Schneider, David Koresh, and several FBI negotiators, in which David says, as soon as I get the seals written, I'm coming out. This was a big decision for him, incidentally, because he believed his doctrine should never be written down until April the 14th. And the FBI negotiators say at one point, can we go to the bank with that? And Koresh says, yes, you can. And at another point, they say, well, will you send us the seals out as you finish them? And he says, yes. My interpretation of those transcripts is that Koresh thought he had an agreement to surrender when he was finished writing those documents. Well, now, the, in, the other side of that coin is the impression being given maybe that Koresh was just simply lying all along, that he was just playing people along outside. I mean, that's, I hear that throughout some of this from the ATF side and the B FBI side of this. Is that, is that not your impression? You know, when a man is dead, we can convict him of anything and accuse him of anything. Uh, Dave, I believe that David was being honest because always before he had said, my message cannot be written. God does not want it written. The Bible's already written and that's all we need. All of a sudden, on the, at the end of Passover, on the 14th of April, he decided that he had to write his message. I think he was persuaded by Tabor and Arnold, two theologians. Uh, but we can't know. 
We can know that he said that. We can't know now what would have happened because we didn't wait to find out. Would you care to give us your criticism, if there is any, of the final day of the, the fire? You said you didn't have time to give that. Uh, and what led up to it? I think the best information on this point, and it supports what I say in my book, is that the methylene chloride that was injected into Mount Carmel with the ferret rounds, that its vapors are flammable. There's a long article in the Sunday issue of the Los Angeles Times by Glenn Bunning that has more expert information than my book had. It establishes methylene chloride is dangerous. You should not throw it inside of buildings, its manufacturer says. What about come along? You had an agent come along. Uh, you said that after he had his little period of time that things really changed when the FBI took over the negotiations. Can you tell us about that? It's, his name was Jim Cavanaugh. I can now say that I'm away from Simon & Schuster's lawyers. <laughs> All right. Um, I think he did a good job, and Koresh and Schneider were greatly displeased when he was pulled off. He did a good job because he let them lecture him on theology, and they thought they were making a convert out of him. And after he was pulled off? They threw a fit because they felt he had been pulled because he had listened to them. And during the time he was on, quite a few people were let out. Is that right? That's right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The, the chair now recognizes the ranking minority member from New York, Mr. Schumer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. First, Mr. Yan, have you read Mr. Revis's book? No. Sorry, I have not. Okay. Well, I've you... read, I read excerpts of it and portions of it, but not the whole book. Okay. From the excerpts you have read and the testimony you've heard today, how would you characterize the accuracy, the factual accuracy of Mr. Revis's beliefs and observations about what the incident in Waco. The, the ones I have direct personal knowledge of, I know he didn't ask me about my knowledge and my involvement, my participation, but he does assert that I had a, a personal interest in the outcome of the trial because I had done it. Uh, the other one is, is uh, for instance, he, he describes me as short. I'm six feet two inches tall, and maybe by Texas Ranger standard, that's short, but an ordinary person, it's not defined right. as short. I, I, I have not had a chance to go through one by one, but like so many of these, uh, not so many, but, but there, are, there are some things that are grossly wrong, some things that are slightly wrong, and some things that are correct. Uh, and I, I really couldn't but give you But does it have a series, or at least the parts you know, a series of inaccuracies? Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, I, uh, this is a, uh, an AK-47 rifle that's converted into a machine gun. Let me ask you, Mr. Yan, do you have any doubt, any doubt, that there were illegally converted machine guns like this in the Davidian compound? None whatsoever. In fact, we found two, one in a car and one in the ashes, both of which still fired. No doubt at all. And second, from your knowledge as a U.S. attorney, do you believe that it is ever, ever appropriate to answer a federal warrant, no matter how poorly drafted, with a machine gun? I don't believe that. I believe that that's the purpose of going to court so you can resolve it. That's the purpose of having excellent attorneys like these defendants did eventually on the trial so that you can make that determination. Thank you. And it's my understanding, by the way, and we'll bring this out later, that none of the excellent attorneys, and he had some of the best in the Southwest, that none of the excellent attorneys that uh, represented the people ever challenged the legality of the warrant. Is that they, correct? No, they, the warrant itself, they did not. They challenged the knock and announce provision. There was a hearing on that, and the court found that it had been complied but with. But not the legality of the warrant. That's correct. And would it, if they thought the warrant was illegal or something was wrong with it, would it not be an ethical violation for them to fail to challenge it? I never like to say an ethical violation because you don't really necessarily force an attorney to make that decision. But, but the, I, these attorneys were good attorneys. Thank you, Mr. Yan. I have no further questions. Okay, the uh, Chairman Klinger, Chairman Hyde are not here, so we'll move on to... Allow me in the rules if I didn't use all my time to yield to one of our members. Is that, is that? Well, we, we, if you do that, we will then have to use, I just passed over two of our members. And no, 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 I don't mean extra time. I mean the remainder of my five minutes. Oh, okay. I mean, it just, we're trying right. to be fair, but. All right. I passed over. We will, we will try in the next round to uh, give Mr. Uh, Ms. Uh, Gene Taylor his time. Thank okay. you. The chair now recognizes the full oversight ranking minority member, Curtis Collins of Illinois. Ms. Collins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
Mr. Yan, gun control opponents have made the serious charge that four ATF agents killed in the raid were shot not by David Davidians, but in fact by other ATF agents in what is called friendly fire. I'd like to ask you to describe the evidence of exactly who shot the four ATF agents. We, we, we did a great deal of research and work on that particular matter, ma'am, because we figured the friendly fire allegation would be one of them. And in fact, we found an instance in which one of the wounded agents totally removed from the deceased agents had in fact probably been hit by one of his own people during the course of the shooting in that little room up there. Oh, every piece of particle or fra fragment that was recovered from these uh, deceased agents was examined by our, our firearms export and compared against the bullets. We took bullets off of every ATF gun that was out there, whether they were fired or not, and compared them against the fragments. There was absolutely no ATF gun that was out there, whether they were fired or not and compared them against the fragments. There was absolutely no, no co comparison whatsoever that would place it with ATF. Moreover, many of them were killed by AK-47 uh, fire, and the AK-47s were only uh, handled by the, or had by the uh, Branch Davidians that day. There were no, no U.S. AK-47s at uh, Mount Carmel. Could you tell me what evidence you have that uh, David Corrish was actually abusing children with the acquiescence of their parents? Uh, we had... Yeah, at trial, we had, at trial we had none. We, we, we were trying to, to introduce that evidence and the court held that because Koresh was dead, the, the probative value was outweighed by the prejudice. I understand there perhaps will be the, the best case we had may testify at this hearing later on and I, I don't want to get in a position of embarrassing a juvenile uh, by making some statement, but we, w the best we had, I understand, will be testifying. Well, the NRA and the committee's Republican staff have attempted to x-ray the 48 illegal weapons, and apparently they believe that some news tests uh, could prove that these were not illegal weapons. Now, could you describe the methods that were used by the prosecutions uh, to determine whether the weapons were, in fact, illegal, Mr. Jones? We, we use Special Agent James Cadigan of the FBI, and I understand he's also scheduled to testify, who had to be one of the best firearms experts I've ever dealt with. I think he had 12 to 15 years' experience. What he did was go through the firearms that were fortunate enough to be intact, and he, he disassembled them, uh, examined them, found out how they had been made. He read the literature. We had the books that they had purchased on how to convert these weapons. Uh, he examined the tools that were used to, uh, to convert these weapons, and then he went back and made a, a basically a firearm by firearm examination of the superficial things that he could see because these guns were all burned and, and they were all encrusted with ashes and everything else. So he could not disassemble them, but he went through and looked for the five or six features that he found common on all the working uh, automatic weapons that were seized at Mount Carmel. And that's what he based his opinion on. In fact, he was very conservative. There were probably some other weapons that, that someone else may have estimated to be automatic, but instead he limited himself to the ones that he found all of those particular portions before he made his opinion, and that was a total of 48. I, um, Mr. Chairman, now the green light is still on. Would I be permitted to yield to Mr. Uh, yes, to Mr. Yes, Mr. Yes, to Mr. Oh, okay. I'll be glad to, to yield to Gene. Mr. Chairman, at yeah, this point. We, what we did, just so everybody understands what we're, we were trying no, to No, you're talking on my time, Mr. Chairman. I, 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 won't, I won't penalize <laughs> you. I'm, I'm, just, I'm going to try to give you something if you really want to accept it. I'll accept it. Okay. It, this, is, this is really straight <laughs> stuff now. Um, in the interest of being fair, we just had another huddle here. Uh, we missed our two chairmen weren't here, so they can't yield their time. We went back over and talked again. Mr. Schumer's comment, he does have a minute left that he can yield. You can take whatever what you want to do with your time as well. So we're doing everything we can to the best of our ability to give you every, every edge we can possibly give you. Yeah, yes. First, I want to thank you for that fairness. And second, it, would it be permissible for my, me at this point, as opposed to later, to yield my additional minute Absolutely. to Mr. Taylor? Do anything you'd like. I yield my remaining time to Mr. Taylor as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, my colleagues. Mr. Revis, I'm somewhat shocked by your statements implying, in effect, that Mr. Kresh was a normal Christian preacher and that he was just going about his normal business uh, as a gun dealer. Do you know of any other Christian churches that buy and sell guns as a business? Is this the what Billy Graham or Pat Robertson or even the Pope of the Catholic Church does? Do you know of any other Christian religions that uh, 
compile a hit list, as Ms. Buns says in her testimony, of former cult members that should be eliminated. Do you know of any other Christian religion that keeps people for three months at a time without their consent? Again, Mr. Chairman, as I said earlier, I don't think we can start on the day of the raid. I think we have to look at the events that led up to the raid to get a true picture of whether or not the people who are paid by this government to enforce the law, the laws that this Congress passes, were acting properly. I'd like you to answer that. Uh, I think you mischaracterized me. In the first place, I don't know what a normal Christian preacher is. And I think if I did, I'd have a lot of denominations on How about top answering of me. the other specific questions? Okay, but secondly, I don't, how do you say it? I say that David Koresh was guilty of arms violations insofar as I can see, and that he was guilty of statutory rape, and that there were grounds on which to arrest him. Nothing I say in my book goes contrary to that. All I was saying in my earlier testimony was that he did not invent his religion. He inherited it and changed it within a tradition. He was not a Charles Manson who cooked up a religion. Mr. Reeves, out of if I may, does your book, and I have not had the opportunity to read it, you know, I understand that the Presbyterians have something like a parish council that chooses the new preacher. I'm a Catholic, the bishop sends us our priests. Tell us how Mr. Koresh got rid of George Rodden. And if this is the normal routine within the Branch Davidians for one preacher to succeed another. Your time is up. If you, if you could just kind of I'm pull a, it together. I'm going to ask the question. It, before 1940, the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association, Koresh's predecessors, adopted a set of rules which says God appoints our prophet. Now, I'm not sure how you know who your prophet is when God appoints him, but Koresh's followers said God had appointed him, and George Roden's followers, of which there weren't many, said George had been appointed by God. And what happened ultimately was that George didn't pay the back taxes on Mount Carmel and David's followers did. So they took possession of Mount Carmel. Now your reference is to a gun battle. That's correct. Uh, where David and them went to shoot a picture at Mount Carmel and wound up in a gunfight with George Roden who was wounded in the thumb. David and his people were tried. All of them but David were acquitted and the jury hung in regards to David. Is that the normal procedure for that church for one preacher to shoot at another? I don't, in that church, no. It had never happened before and I don't guess it would ever happen again. Time has expired. Uh, the uh, chair now recognizes the full judiciary ranking member, Mr. John Conyers from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've got a uh, some conflicting testimony here about who David Koresh was. And it's, it's not at all clear to me uh, what kind of picture is emerging. We find that uh, conceitedly he's probably committed crimes against minors, young girls. He's violated gun laws. Uh, we, we have a, a curious picture emerging here. And I'd just like to inquire of Mr. Rivas, who's been pretty helpful. Um, did you state in your book at page 122 that you thought that the ATF was seeking to enforce unconstitutional firearms laws? I think what you'll find in that chapter of my book is that I found a scholar who studied the constitutional history of firearms laws and whose opinion is that they may not be constitutional. I'm not a judge and I don't know. I was quite impressed to find out that that argument could be made and thought readers deserved a chance to, to see it. Uh -huh. Well, now that you've studied it and written and promoted it, what do you think now? Whether or not they're constitutional? Uh, aren't you worried about that? Yeah, whether they're constitutional. Tell you what. I mean, is it, auto is it, is it okay for everybody to carry automatic weapons and, uh, and, and defend themselves on the basis that they're unconstitutional? No, on the, 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 the present state book. of the law, it's clearly not. 
Thank you very much. Now, did you state that in your book anywhere? Did I state what? What you just said. Namely, that, that it is not constitutional to carry automatic weapons. I said it was illegal. Yeah. In your book? Sure. Here. I just said well, here, I just said. Well, at page 120, I know what you Show said me the here. Line. Just a moment. If the findings of these professors are trustworthy, the laws that the ATF sought to enforce at Mount Carmel on February 28th were unconstitutional. Right. Quote. If the findings of these professors are trustworthy, that is a question to be litigated in the courts. Okay. Page 293. The prosecution heaps of evidence also included what appeared to be illegal homemade silencers for rifles and 48 semi-automatic rifles that had been converted to automatic fire. Does that concern you about a being unconstitutional? That's a violation of law, isn't it? That's certainly what I say. It's certainly what you say here. It's not what you said in the book. No. In the book, I was reviewing the work of oh, a professor okay. who argues that these laws aren't constitutional. I, I get it. I, I understand. You've learned a lot since you wrote the book. That's what I'm, I'm beginning to understand. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that we're kind of getting this down to, to some, some little finer points here. I mean, it's nice to write a book about what may or may not be constitutional and unconstitutional, but yet when you come here to testify, well, there's no question now that you've thought about it, uh, th this is not so unconstitutional as, as you would have thought. I now, didn't just say a it moment, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't ask you a question there. I was just reviewing your, your testimony. Mr. Hahn, I'd like to just invite you to tell us a little bit about this warrant. I mean, could there be any question about its invalidity? We didn't have any question about it, sir. Uh, we looked it over. There was, there was a lot of surplusage. There's a lot of stuff that perhaps should not have been in there. There's a lot of stuff that had I been the author, I might not have uh, included. And in fact, there was some that was deleted before the final warrants were served. But I had no question as to its validity. And, and the people that had put it together were not newcomers to this business. They'd been doing this for quite a few years, had they not? That's correct. And I think you'll always find room for our lawyers to argue one way or the other. That's what they're paid for, and that's what they're trained to do. Finally, the dynamic entry question. I mean, Gentlemen, was there any way we could have... expired, if you could kind of just bring I'll it together. I'll just finish. Let him respond. Is there any way we could have avoided a dynamic entry in this case? You're, you're asking far beyond my capability, sir. That would be something that I would have to defer to the experts, which would either be uh, the FBI, hostage rescue, SWAT type mm -hmm. people, or the DEAs, or the ATFs. We, we'll get to them. Thank you very much. Mr. Revis, did you have a chance to respond to one of Mr. Kanye's questions? I, I want to make sure we're fair to everybody here. I hadn't asked him a question that he didn't respond to. I was making him an observation. you agree? I, d I do not agree. Okay. Would well, you like I, to respond? I don't agree with the witness. Would, would you like to respond? Go ahead and respond. Yes. Mr. Chairman, j just a minute, Mr. Chairman. I'm just On, trying to be fair. And I, I want to be very fair, but any questions my witnesses don't answer, I'll, I'll get to the bottom of it. I don't need the chairman to help me get the response from questions I ask the witnesses. Thank you very much. And anybody else that wants to ask him about it can do it on their own time Chair. regularly according. I would just, I would just like to, to ask my colleague, uh, in, in the event, if the witness was cut off and didn't get a chance to respond, I just wanted to be fair and give the man a chance to finish what he said. I was just pointing out to you that he did not fail to respond to any questions that I asked. I was satisfied with that. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I think it is incumbent upon all of us to extend courtesy to these witnesses, and I don't see what harm would, would result or ensue if the gentleman were allowed to explain perhaps a response he didn't get a chance to do. Mr. Chairman, since everybody wants this question that I didn't answer answered, I'd be delighted to invite Mr. Revis to make any I thank my colleague from Michigan. In the interest of fairness and everything, thank you very much. I think we have to distinguish between illegality and constitutionality. I'll give you an example. 
One time I was convicted of vagrancy and leading a profligate life in Alabama. What I did was illegal. Later it turned out that the law under which I was convicted was ruled unconstitutional. There's always that gap. You never know when a law is constitutional. You presume it is at the point of arrest. Things are afterwards tested. David Koresh's possession of arms was illegal. Whether or not the arms laws are constitutional will be, at this point, the courts say they are. Tomorrow they may say different because of the research I cite in my book. Thank you very much. This uh, completes the first panel, and uh, I thank the witnesses for coming. Give, thank you for your patience and all of the votes and everything. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, the next uh, panel if they would move forward. Thank you. I'll yield to Bill McCollum. If I could, I would uh, thank the chairman for, of the Subcommittee on Oversight for yielding to me. Uh, we are going to share this podium today by prearranged agreement. The committee will be in order. And uh, I would like to, by name, introduce the panel of the next uh, group of witnesses who are coming forward to, to be our testimony uh, for this, this second round. The first witness is Gerald Goldstein. Mr. Goldstein is president of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Next to Mr. Goldstein is Robert DeCamp, president of the National District Attorneys Association. The third witness is Henry McMahon, a firearms dealer who did business with David Koresh. The fourth witness is David Thibodeau, who was a resident at Mount Carmel throughout the siege. The fifth witness is Kiri Jewell, who also was a resident at Mount Carmel. And our final witness on this panel is Lewis Barber, a former lieutenant with the McLennan County Sheriff's Office. Now, if each of you would stand, I'm going to have to swear you in at this point in time, according to our procedures. If you'd raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please. The record will, uh, you may be seated. The record will show that all answered in the affirmative. At this point in time, under the rules that we've unanimously agreed to do in this joint committee, uh, I yield 15 minutes to Mr. Barr. Mr. Barr? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do we have the uh, names in the proper locations there? No, no that's not. The clerk's well, I think lot. we do have a little uh, reversal. Let's see if we got it right here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thibodeau. Excuse me, before we, get, before, we get, before we get started, is Mr. Barber here with us today? Did I miss him as a witness? We asked him to come forward, and apparently he is not with us today. Is that correct? He's our witness. Well, we apparently are missing Mr. Barber from this panel for whatever reason. Who's the gentleman sitting next Could the to the gentleman right sitting there. next to Mr. Thibodeau and Ms. Ms. Jewell t uh, tell us who you are, please, sir? That's very good. We're Mr. happy to Mr. have Chairman, you. Mr. Chairman, I couldn't hear that. Mr. Uh, he is the he is uh, Kerry's father. Would you turn on the microphone and put that in the record, please, sir? My name is David. You need to turn it on. There's a little little flick right under there, to the forward. There you go. Okay, thank you. It's working now. My name is David Jewell. I'm Kerry's father. Thank you very much. Apparently, we are missing Mr. Barber, and we don't have him here. So, if we get a chance to bring him up on another panel, we will. But otherwise, please, Mr. Barr, proceed. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Thibodeau, if you could please, uh, over here, to your left. Thank you. Uh, appreciate your coming here. Uh, if you could please uh, recount uh, very briefly the extent of your knowledge of the uh, compound at uh, Mount Carmel. How long were you there and in what capacity, please? Um, I met Koresh in approximately 80, 91. And um, I had the opportunity after about three or four months of getting to know him and some of the people of going to Passover of 91, I believe it was, at, in Waco. Um, I was there for about two or three weeks. And then I went up north to Maine. And then I went back to California, where uh, David had a property there. And I spent some time there. Um, I also had an apartment at the time, and I was between the two. And then finally they decided they were going to move back to Waco for a while. So I went with them at this point. I was becoming involved in the music 
and uh, the spiritual teachings and decided to move. Um, I was there for some time and for the next couple years was on and off between California and Waco. Were you familiar with uh, uh, Mr. Koresh's uh, daily habits, what he did? Yeah. Uh, including on what occasions and under what circumstances he would leave the compound? Um, pretty much. I mean, I lived with him on a daily basis, on and off. I mean, you know, I had certain things that I did. I was really concentrating on music, and I obviously would not be questioning him when he would go to town and things, but there were times when, you know, I would go various places with him. So I guess yes. Okay. Uh, was there any regularity uh, to his, uh, his leaving the compound? Did he leave uh, certain days, certain days of the week, certain times, or was it sporadic? It was sporadic. I mean, there would be times when he would not leave at all, when he would just uh, stay in and, and give studies, and there would be other times when he would leave. Um, but it was, he, he left frequently. Would that include during the uh, two or three months prior to the raid in February? In other words, uh, during the month of February and January and then December of 1992, did he leave the compound on uh, numerous occasions? Right before the, are you, I'm sorry, was it two or three weeks before the raid? or, two or three, During the two or three months yes. before the, the raid? Yes, he did. Yes, he okay. did. Do you recall or do you know uh, what was the last time he left the compound. I recall that approximately two weeks before the raid, he was going through a period of time where he wanted to get back into health and back into shape. And so he would go out running, and some of the guys would go jogging with him. And he would go up the driveway to where the double E, I believe it was the double E ranch road, the dirt road that was in front of the building. And he would jog directly in front of the two houses that are across the street. One, of course, was the uh, surveillance house. Um, all the way down to the stop sign, maybe about a mile or so, I'm not really sure uh, what the measurements were, and then back. And then usually, you know, some of the guys would come on the property and, you know, we'd do some jogging on the property as well. And I know that he went to town uh, infrequently, but still went to town on a number of occasions. Um, I guess one thing that I could try to refer you to is that I remember during the course of the 51-day standoff when um, the FBI, I believe it was the FBI initially, said that he never left the building. You know, we, he never left. Uh, we, we couldn't possibly have gotten him. I remember the Waco Tribune Herald and some other um, media came forward because a number of people within the community of Waco had come forward saying that they had seen him in their places of business just days before the raid. I believe one was Chelsea's Barn Grill. And uh, that's the only one that really stands out. But I remember a couple of businessmen from Waco came forward saying he was in my store just last week or just the other day. When, when he would go jogging, was this at, at night or during the day? During the day. Uh, would he make any effort to hide the fact that he was leaving the compound to go jogging? No. When you, when you go jogging with a group of five or six guys, I, I don't think you can really conceal that. Okay. Uh, are you familiar, Mr. Thibodeau, with the affidavit in support of the search warrant uh, in this in this case I, I have read it but I'm not that proficient with all the technicalities in it no, I, I understand that but you have read it you're generally familiar with it generally very generally uh, yes do you recall it as being a rather lengthy document yes I do uh, do you recall it as being a document that had all sorts of stuff just kind of thrown together in it yeah it it's it's to me, it seemed to be kind of like a, a press report, only in a legal document. I mean, you know, it talked about, obviously, um, I mean, from my understanding of the law, if you're going to go after someone for what you consider to be illegal activity, that's what you would concentrate on in a search and arrest warrant. And from my understanding is, it try, you know, they, it went into the wives and the different aspects that have been covered today of uh, certain aspects of, of child abuse that's trying to be proven. So I, I guess that was kind of a regular. I remember one thing that kind of stood out, and it only stood out because it was pointed out to me later, is I believe, if I'm correct, it talks about uh, an AK-47 having an upper and a lower receiver. Um, I think anyone who's familiar with that particular firearm knows that there is no upper and lower receiver to an AK-47, which would indicate that there was a problem with the search warrant, specifically with that uh, one particular firearm. Okay, you saw 
I forget who it was on the other side, uh, make a big deal of holding up a, a weapon a, a few moments ago. Uh, Actually, I think I was outside. I had to, go, I had to leave oh, for a well, moment. You, you, missed, you missed quite a show. Uh, there was a, you know, a weapon uh, held up uh, uh, stating it was a, a machine gun or whatnot, which certainly raises questions about what it's doing here. Mm -hmm. uh, do you recall uh, seeing, seeing machine guns uh, no. at the compound? No. I did see AK-47s and I did see AR-15s and there were times, various times, when different people would go out and shoot on the firing range. Uh, there were times when people that we knew from the community would come out and fire at our firing range. And, you know, to me, I'm from, I'm from the east. Um, I'm from up in Maine and I was not raised around firearms and it, to me it, was, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't something that I was really into. But being there, I did notice that there was kind of a different mentality. I, I don't know if it would be Texas or whatnot, but it seemed like a lot of our neighbors would come over, you know, neighbors from in the community would come over and, and, and fire. And it, it didn't seem to be as big a thing as it did where I was from, so it became acceptable. Okay. Uh, is it possible that there, that there were machine guns there that, that you weren't aware of? Yes, that's possible. Okay. There was also in this... Um, rather lengthy affidavit discussion of a of a meth lab uh, which I believe having been a prosecutor uh, refers to, would refer to methamphetamine which is a controlled substance a mind-altering drug are you aware of any uh, of any such uh, uh, facility anywhere on the compound there was absolutely no drugs at Mount Carmel period other than alcohol once in a great while uh, when it was when we worked particularly hard and you know everyone felt that they just needed to unwind but generally, anything like that was done. There was a sobriety there that was to be practiced. And anything that, like that that was done was on a very sporadic basis. And David Koresh was absolutely against drugs. David is Koresh was actually... Is it possible that there was a, a, a laboratory a manufacturing control not substance when I was there. that you it's, hadn't known about? No, I'd, I've been all over that property, and I never saw anything that, would even, that I would even think would be. I, I, that's absolutely impossible. Okay. Uh, another one of the items that was contained in the affidavit referred to pineapple-style hand grenades, uh, those that I suppose you see in uh, magazines that people use for paperweights. Uh, uh, have you seen those? I saw the casings for those, but I didn't see, you know, an actual grenade. I mean, I, I see the casings, yes. Okay. Uh, were these live grenades? Not to my knowledge. I mean, let me put it to you this way. I didn't, I've never seen one exploded or go off other than war movies and things like that. Um, but I, I just don't know. Okay. Uh, do you know whether or not uh, the compound was ever visited by agents of the Drug Enforcement Administration uh, investigating allegations of a methamphetamine lab? No, I don't. Um, I know that there was some activity that took place in 1987, a few years before I was there. And it was revolving around what the gentleman over here brought up, the uh, George Roden issue. And from what my understanding was, and this came from a couple different people that, w that were within the community there, was that when David came out on that particular, that particular incident that was discussed earlier, um, he was shot at uh, by George Roden and some of the guys, especially I, I think it was Stan Silva and, um, and Floyd Hauptman were shot at. And so they were in an open field to protect them to protect them, David shot at George, hitting the tree in front of him. Now, what I found out later, and again, this is word of mouth, was that there were things that were found that could constitute making a methamphetamine lab. There was certain chemicals and things that were found. Now, the understanding that I have from a couple different people was that, was that that was turned over to the Sheriff's Department. And when the whole thing went to trial, the evidence of any methamphetamines somehow uh, were not at the trial. They seemed to have disappeared. I don't know what all that means, but these are the stories that I heard from a number of different people that were around at that era of time. Okay. Would you uh, uh, tell me what the, the term mag bag means, if anything, to you? I knew mag bag just to be a garage that was about two to three miles away from where the building was. I know that there was a car restoration company going there. Peter two, Hipsman. Two, two or three miles from the, the, the living quarters? Yes. That, that's a rough estimate. I'm pretty bad with distances and numbers. But it was quite a ways. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I, May, maybe not by Texas terms. Yeah, by but Texas uh, terms, exactly. Terms that's what be. I was thinking. Yes, it was quite. I, I, it, it would have been a long walk. 
Let me put it that way. You know, you probably could have biked, biked it in about an hour. Okay. And what, what was the mag bag? Like I said, it was a, just a garage where they restored cars, custom Camaros, things like this. I know that Peter Hipsman and Michael Schroeder were down there uh, pretty frequently. They, they actually lived there. And Bob, Bob Kendrick, for a time, lived there as well. And, but it was Peter that did the majority of the work, actually painting and restoring the cars, and Mike did the mechanical work. Okay. Did the term refer to anything else as far as you know, for example, a, a corporate entity by that name? That's possible. Okay, you, you're not aware of that, though? No, it's not my okay. thing. Uh, Mr. Goldstein, if, if I could ask you, uh, if you have had the opportunity to review the affidavit that I've been taking a few moments here to review with uh, Mr. Thibodeau. I have. Uh, Thank you. I have. Uh, could you please, uh, we've, we've heard testimony uh, speculation earlier about its sufficiency and whether or not it was subject to a successful challenge or not, and apparently it, uh, it, it was withstood at least whatever judicial scrutiny it was afforded previously. What, uh, in your opinion, uh, as, a, uh, as a learned uh, uh, an attorney with, with experience in reviewing and I suppose challenging affidavits, is your impression of this affidavit? It, like many other affidavits that lawyers that practice in the criminal courts from one courthouse to another across this country, uh, is not terribly atypical. I will tell you that it is chock full of irrelevant, highly inflammatory material. That's not that unusual. Many of you are good lawyers. That's what lawyers usually do, is try and convince somebody of something. Uh, it definitely has uh, matters that fall well beyond, for example, the either expertise or jurisdiction of the particular agency seeking the warrant. That is, matters of child molestation that obviously would inflame anyone that read it, uh, just like it probably has the people that listen to this hearing. Nevertheless, they had little to do with the underlying justification for the entry. Uh, there are allegations that many of these matters are misstated. Uh, quite frankly, uh, 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 one of the problems that we have is quite, if I could tell you gentlemen anything about what we need to do is that those of us who are in the trenches trying these cases day in and day out are gumming these law enforcement agents to death. We have been deprived of any teeth in the exclusionary rule and the mechanism that we have, the sole Fourth Amendment protection that we have uh, to attempt to regulate these agencies and efforts to uh, dilute that protection is frustrating any, that's if you want to know why nobody filed a motion to suppress, I would suggest that that probably goes a long way. For example, misstatements. Uh, if there is an omission, critical omission, that would have made a difference to a magistrate, if one of these statements in the affidavit, in fact, is an outright lie, in order to get a hearing, in order to subpoena a single witness, in order to ask a single question, we've got to show by affidavit or sworn testimony or otherwise that there is a lie in the affidavit before we even get a chance to have a hearing. I wish I had eight days of congressional hearings on every warrant that I suspect is, is, is flawed with misstatements. Uh, I've never had a suppression hearing that lasted eight days, much less this kind uh, uh, of inquiry. The fact that the warrant may lack probable cause, it's a pretty close call. This one might, just might lack probable cause. But quite frankly, to the lawyers that were out there in the trenches trying this case, it didn't make a hill of beans. It wouldn't matter because the good faith exception allows the judge to admit evidence even though the affidavit and the warrant totally lack probable cause. That's where the problem and that's where the solution can come. Not in providing more authority to law enforcement, uh, not in being concerned about this abuse on today and yet passing measures that in fact uh, uh, apply the good faith exception that I just described from warrants and apply it to warrantless searches. Senate Bill 3, Section 507 will do away with the exclusionary rule altogether. We'll have no way of restricting uh, and discouraging officers from engaging in these kinds of activities. Mr. Barr, your time is, is up. Thank you, Mr. Be Chairman. Before we proceed further, I notice Mr. Barber has joined us at the witness table. You need to be sworn in, Mr. Barber. If you'd stand and raise your right hand. Do you uh, solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. 
Let the record, thank you, you may be seated. Let the record reflect the witness responded in the affirmative. I now yield 15 minutes to Ms. Furman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I believe that all of you have some testimony in front of you from Carrie Jewell. I'm going to ask for part of my time for her to have the opportunity to read in to the record her particular testimony, um, and, and then we can proceed from there. Carrie, welcome, and thank you for being here. You can begin. When my mother and I first joined David Koresh, he was still Vernon Howell, and his group was living in a little two-bedroom house in San Bernardino, California. I was five or six. We lived with the group off and on there and in Pomona, California, in Palestine and Waco, Texas, and in Laverne, California. When we joined, David was planning to lead the group to Israel to retake Jerusalem. He taught that there would be a big battle between the forces of the world and David and his people. The world would win and we would be killed, but we'd come back in a cloud and smite the wicked and retake the world. The details would change as David received more messages from God, but there was never a time when we didn't expect to be killed by the feds, who David said were Babylon. While we waited for this to happen, we built up an army for David, so the battle would be big one and all the world would know the power of David and God. In the meantime, David was very strict about how we should live. He only spanked me twice, though I knew he spanked other people or had them spanked. He personally spanked me because I was said I was going on a diet when I was about eight years old. He used the big wooden boat oar they used for adults, not the wooden spoon they called Little Helper. The second time David spanked me and the other kids, it involved getting candy from vending machines against his teachings. Before spanking us that time, he bought an enormous lot of candy and made us eat it till we were sick. It was common for David to sleep in a bed with women and children. Sometimes I fell asleep in his room after meeting, or maybe I'd fall asleep on his bed watching MTV. I didn't even think about it because the women and girls were all David's wives, or would be, and many of the kids were his too. Even if he wasn't really our father, we were taught that he was our real father. I've slept together with him and my mom and Lisa Ferris. I've slept with him and Aisha Garifas. Aisha was older than I was. She was probably 13 when I was six or seven. She became one of David's wives when she was 14 and had a baby for him. Once she was pregnant, I never saw her. She was kept hidden because she wasn't an adult. David took me on a motorcycle trip with some of the guys to Mount Baldy when I was about seven. On that trip, he took me for a ride down a mountain ski trail on a chairlift. There wasn't any snow, but it seemed like we could see the whole world. That was when David said to me personally that one day I would be one of his wives. We all knew about sex because David talked about it a lot. He made us watch movies that showed sex and war like Platoon and Hamburger Hill over and over again. I was scared by the rape scene, but I would have been more scared to try to leave the room when he was there. We also watched Miracle of Life to see how babies were born. David talked about having sex with his sister-in-law, Michelle Jones, for the first time. She was young and scared. He said he got into bed with her and was trying to pull down her underwear while she was trying to keep it on. He said her heart was beating really fast. He talked about how he liked Novelette Sinclair playing with his nipples and that Janine Buns had the type of pussy that really held on to his dick. Those are completely his words, not mine. I was in the meeting at the White House in California where he told Judy Schneider to stand up and then asked the guys if any of them lusted after her. A few of them nodded. He told her to pull her skirt up. She pulled it up a little way, and he told her to pull it higher. He told her higher several times before she got it up enough. I hate to do that, Kerry, but we just realized that your testimony has very graphic material, explicit material, and you have a very general audience that's watching this, and I just think they should be warned about that fact. Uh, it is testimony of record. Your father is with you. You've been asked by a member of Congress to read it. But I think we need to be aware that you have a very wide television audience, and this is not in any way censored. So I just as a fair warning to the public generally, I'll let the time be added. Uh, can I, can but I just ask Mrs. Okay. Sherman if, if you, if it, it's your witness, do you feel comfortable? Mr. Mr. Chairman, our, I have actually talked with Kerry about this, asking her if she felt comfortable in responding to this very same issue that I might have raised here. She does, she wants the story out there. She feels compelled to tell the story. These are the words and what she heard and saw during the time that she was there. I agree that they are explicit, but I think that we also need to understand who we were dealing with. Excuse me, I believe we have a witness here. 
a 14 yeah, I, I years old. I believe it is regular. At this, at this point in time, the, the questions have been asked and whatever, and the witness may proceed to give her testimony. I think we needed to put it on the record more for the home audience than anybody else or whatever. But nonetheless, you may proceed, and I'll add the additional minute or two that we've taken up for this discussion. Kiri, please proceed. Thank you. He told her higher several times before she got it up enough. Then he asked the guys, now do you lust after her? Lots of them said yes, loudly. Judy just seemed shocked and embarrassed, but like everybody else, she wanted to please David. You couldn't really think about not doing what he said. My mom and Lisa and I went to Texas for Passover in 1991. David took the three of us to a motel. There were two chairs in the room, one bed that we all slept in. My mom and Lisa made soup in a crock pot. We were there for two or three days, just mostly hanging around the room. David preached to us. I sat on the floor playing with his shoelaces while he talked. We watched Ernest goes to camp. The cops came once and just sat outside. After my mom threw something in the trash, they checked the garbage. Then they went away. My mom and Lisa went to do a little shopping. I took a shower and then I was brushing my hair, sitting in the chair, and David took me, told me to come and sit down by him in the bed. I was wearing a long white t-shirt and panties. He kissed me and sat there, but then he laid me down. He took his penis and rubbed it on the outside of my vagina while he was still kissing me. I had known this would happen sometime, so I just laid there and sat, stared at the ceiling. I didn't know how to kiss him back. Anyway, I was still kind of freaked out. When he was finished, he told me to go take a shower. I walked to the bathroom with my panties down around my ankles. In the bathroom, I realized I was all wet and gooey on my legs. That freaked me out more. I just stayed in the shower for maybe an hour. When I came out, David was in his jeans and the bed was made. He told me to come here again. This time he read to me from the Song of Solomon. I was 10 years old when this happened. I remember sitting in the gas station wondering when it would do it again. I wasn't afraid, but I was nervous. I knew I couldn't get pregnant because I hadn't started having periods yet. This was soon before I left my mother for what turned out to be the last time. I didn't tell her about what David had done in the motel. Sometime later, she asked she said David's habit was to sleep with one of his wives then leave them for a long time. I said, yeah, I know. She said, what, did he take you? I just said, yeah. She wasn't mad or anything. I asked my mom, what would we do if we ever left here? She said, we'll never leave, so I asked. I never liked it there, but I wouldn't leave my mother, so I figured I'd be there with her till the end. The end meant the great battle between David and his people and the rest of the world. We were always waiting for and preparing for the feds to come in. The people in the group didn't have to train for war, but if they didn't choose to, David would ask them why not. Dana Okimoto and Janet McBean were in nursing, and Janet said that maybe Janine, who was also a nurse, could, could and would provide cyanide so we could all commit suicide if it came down to it. It was also accepted that the best way to shoot yourself if necessary in this battle with Babylon was to put the gun in your mouth back to the soft spot above your throat before pulling the trigger. When it was almost time for me to leave Michigan and go back home to my mom from my last visit to Michigan as a Davidian, my dad told me he had a court order for me to stay with him. I was shocked and scared. My mom and Steve Schneider were on the phone to me telling me stuff like, remember little Esther, so I would remain true to David. She told me David had, gone, had given beer to S Rachel Sylvia, who was then 11 or 12, to soften her up. My mom said I needed to hurry up and get back there or I would lose my place to Rachel. She told me, it's time to fight. Are you ready? Carrie, thank you. Um, let me ask you a couple of other, well, let me give you a few minutes. You want to get a drink of water? Okay. Could somebody give her a drink of water, please? Mr. Chairman, since we have a vote going on right now, could it be a possibility that we could go ahead and vote and let her have some time and also... I'd be very happy, I'd be very happy to do that. In fact, we'll add another minute or two back to your time and give you, Thank you. 10 minutes when you get back. Thank you very much. I, I inquire. I thought the time was up. How much time is remaining? Well, she, she has about eight minutes remaining on her time. The first uh, clock went up, so there's about eight minutes left on Ms. Thurman's time. At this point in time, apparently we have a second vote after this. This is the type of vote we had previously. We'll recess until 
five minutes after the conclusion of the last of this series of votes. This was the first day of Waco hearings before the House Government Oversight and Judiciary Committees. We'll continue testimony in a moment, but first, some program information. C-SPAN Saturday Journal offers a look at the morning newspaper headlines, interviews with journalists, newsmakers, and legislators, as well as your comments and questions. And through July, the C-SPAN school bus live from landmark sites around Washington, D.C. This Saturday, we visit the Organization of American States. Saturday Journal at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Here's some of what's on our companion network, C-SPAN 2. The Future of Affirmative Action, Reaction to the President's Speech Today at the National Archives. Right now, remarks by members of the Congressional Black Caucus. That's followed by Republican Congressman Gary Franks of Connecticut and Republican Senator Phil Graham of Texas. And then, a briefing by House Democratic lawmakers, including Nita Lowy of New York and Pat Schroeder of Colorado. And that's some of what can be seen tonight on our companion network, C-SPAN 2. We continue now with the Waco investigation, the first day of hearings before a House Joint Subcommittee. Chairing the hearing, Republican Bill Zeliff of New Hampshire and Republican Bill McCollum of Florida. Hey, they got you. This uh, joint hearing will come to order. When we uh, took a recess, we were in the middle of Ms. Thurman's questioning. Ms. Thurman, you have eight minutes left. Uh, I will turn the clock on. It runs for five of those eight, and then we'll notify you as you get your three minutes down. Thank you. Ms. Thurman? Gary, uh, let me ask you a, a couple of questions now dealing with some of the issues that um, have surrounded this case. In February, it's my understanding that you were actually or went to Waco um, actually before the February 28th. Is that correct? Yeah. Do you want to tell me what happened when you talked to the, was it the ATF or FBI that you actually talked to? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Would um, you like to just tell the panel what happened while you were there? While I was there, I went to a courthouse, the same courthouse that I was in when George Roden, that whole thing with him was going on. It was that courthouse. And um, the only thing I really remember talking with them that stands out in my mind was uh, they asked me about being molested. And I told them everything that I told you. And um, we, we, my dad and I, and the agent that was with us drove around um, like pretty much all of Waco looking for the hotel or motel that um, I was molested in. And we couldn't find it because I really don't, it was dark when we got there and it was dark when we left. So I really didn't get a very good view of the outside of the motel. But that was pretty much all that we did when we were there. Okay. And then on <coughs> February 28th, when the raid took place, what did you tell your father about what you thought might happen there? I told him there was no way that anybody was going to get out. They were, somehow, they were all going to die. What makes you believe that? He taught it. He told us from the beginning, from the beginning, sometime we were all going to die. And I didn't know when, and I didn't know how, but I told my dad the day the raid happened, none of us were going to, or none of them were going to get out. And then you went on Donahue, I understand, and I believe that was March 10th. Mm -hmm. And and were what kinds of questions happened on there, or or maybe what happened from there? They asked a lot about the Star of David that everyone wore. They asked um, what what was the Star of David? It was just a 
sign that you were in the group. I mean, that's all it was. A lot of people, there have been a lot of rumors that it meant that you were a wife, and but the men wore it too, so it couldn't have meant you were a wife. I mean, but it, it was just signifying that you believed and that you were in it, and you know, it, it wasn't anything really about the wives, because the men had them. Okay. So, um, on Donahue, I told Donahue and the audience that that it was my belief that they were going to commit suicide, and the cult expert that they had told me I was wrong. And I told him, watch. And then, Carrie, it's my understanding that your father actually sent a letter um, to President Clinton, and I believe it was March 28th. Um, I believe. Have you had an opportunity to, to look at that letter? Just briefly. My dad wrote it. And in it, it, it kind of based itself on the situations that, that I guess he and you had talked about. Mm -hmm. Have you and your dad had a lot of time to talk and converse about what happened there? Yeah. So that he kind of knew what was going on. It yeah. might be for our benefit, if it's okay, if we just put that letter into the record. I'll be glad to... Um, have a copy of it. I just received without, without it objection. this morning. Um, in that letter, basically, it talked about um, the allegiance and the possibility of them committing, I guess, suicide. Nobody was going to get out of there, but that the government needed to do something at this point, or we could, we could even have a harder term. Carrie, do you know of any other um, children of your age or maybe a little older that were put into the same situation that you were? Michelle Jones, um, Aisha Garifas, um, the Karen Doyle. There, I, I know there are more, but this is just like off the top of my head and it, I can't. It's not coming to me. And, and you had said in your testimony that once, I guess, they were pregnant, they were removed from the rest of the group. Is that? Not always. Um, actually, Aisha was the only one that I was around when she was pregnant. So, because I don't know about Michelle when she had her babies. Um, but when Aisha was pregnant, I never saw her. She was kept inside her house. Do you know why? Because it was Passover and there were a lot of people from all over coming, and she didn't, she wasn't supposed to be seen pregnant because she was young. Okay, tell me about the suicide stuff a little bit because you mentioned that at the end about the cyanide and the and the gun. How did you know about that? I mean, was it taught to you? Did you just kind of know it? I mean, can you explain that maybe a little bit to us? It wasn't taught. It was known. I, ever since I was little, I've been, I've had big ears, and I like to learn. I like to observe, and and I heard. I I observed, and it was known. I mean, I just didn't think up this stuff as a 14-year-old kid. I have, you know, it was learned. This Not, was your family. The, yeah. I mean, I found it interesting in talking with you that you knew so many of the, the players in all of this. When I talked to you about the mailman, Mr. Jones, I mean, you just kind of responded as if you knew all about him. Um, Carrie, why do you think it's important that you gave the testimony that you gave today? I mean, these are your... I, mean, I don't think it's right that people are getting things out of this that they shouldn't be. People are hurting and they need to know the truth. This is my truth. It might not be somebody else's truth, but this is what I saw and this is what happened to me. Um, people are getting too much out of this that they don't deserve. They have not worked for any of it. They don't, it's not for them. They're making too much out of this than it should be. I, I just thought people should know what I saw. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. I'm, I'm through, Mr. Chairman. Well, 
Thank you very much, Ms. Thurman. You were right almost on the money anyway without realizing it, I'm sure, but thank you. And thank you, Carrie. That was not an easy testimony, but we really do appreciate it and understand it and appreciate uh, what you've gone through. It's very, very difficult. Mr. Schiff, 15 minutes for you. You're recognized. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Before beginning my questioning of this panel, I want to explain, thank you, I want to explain, before beginning my questioning of this panel, I'd like to explain what my point of view is going to be in these questions. Um, David Koresh has never been a hero to me. I think it's obvious that he broke laws. In my view, if he had surrendered at some point, the greatest loss of life which did occur may well not have occurred. But the difference between David Koresh and the Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and the Federal Bureau of Investigation is that David Koresh was not working for the federal government in, in 1993, but the, but the FBI and the ATF were all federal employees in 1993. Now, the point is that federal agencies like the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms have an accountability to the government and to the people at all times, no matter what kind of people that they are dealing with. So, in my judgment, Mr. Koresh's personal practices, however despicable they obviously were, have nothing to do with a hearing on how the uh, Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms handled a firearms violation case. And I want to say to you, Kerry, personally, that, I, that I'm very sorry that you were not protected from David Koresh. I'm very sorry that you were not protected during this hearing because it could have been arranged that you testify with no cameras going if we had known what your testimony would have been. But I can only say to you, I'm very glad you weren't in that compound uh, in February of 1993 and later when it burned down. With that, I'd like to ask a question of Mr. Mac uh, McMahon, if I may. Yes, sir. Sir, it is my understanding that you are a firearms dealer, is that right? Yes, sir. Could you tell briefly where that is and for how long? Well, I started in uh, Gulf Breeze, Florida. And, uh, I'm, uh, right, right at the scene, though, we're talking about. Could you, you move the microphone up closer, please? Yes, sir. We're not able to hear you very well. Thank you. For how long in Waco, Texas? I'm sorry. Two and a half years. Um, okay. 1991 to uh, 1993. And you have a federal firearms license? I did, yes, sir. At the time you did? Yes, sir. And did you do business with uh, David Koresh? Yes, sir, I did. And uh, did he purchase firearms from you? Yes, sir, he did. Did you ever sell him any illegal firearms? Illegal, no, sir. Did he ever say that he wanted illegal firearms? No, sir. Did he ever say why he wanted firearms in the first place? As an investment. How can one use firearms as an investment? The guns that he was buying would go up in value, no, <coughs> no question. Okay. And do, do you know other people who do that? Yes, sir. It's not uncommon by no, itself. No, sir, is it? not by far. No. All right. And um, uh, did you have a visit specifically from uh, ATF Special Agent Aguilera uh, in June of 1992 uh, related to Mr. Koresh? Uh, July 1992. July of 1992? Yeah, Davey Aguilera and Jimmy R. Skinner. Okay. And um, did uh, they, they were investigating Mr. Koresh at that time, is that right? That is apparent now. It wasn't at that time. And, uh, but wasn't there a phone call between you and Mr. Koresh while the special agent was there? Yes, sir. Would you briefly say what that conversation was about? Yes, sir. Uh, while ATF was there asking questions about David, they were asking questions, where did he get his money? What's he going to do with these guns? Why does he need these guns? I was asking these type of questions. And these aren't compliance check questions, and that's what he was there to do, was ask compliance. They were there to do compliance. These aren't compliance check questions. And so I was concerned that I was going to give him an answer that I shouldn't. So I called David up, and I told David they're here asking these questions. And David said, well, if there's a problem, tell them to come out here. And I said, well, hang on. I got this walking around phone. I walked back into my gun room, and there's David Aguilar sitting down. Jimmy R. Spinner is standing up to the left. And I go, well, I got David Koresh on the phone. And David Aguilera, he goes, he jumps up and goes, don't go, don't go. And I go, I, I, I got him on the phone. And he goes, and so I looked at Mr. Skinner and I said, uh, well, do y'all need to go out there? I mean, you know, he's going, y'all got a problem? Come out there. And he's going, we do not need to go out there at this time. And so I looked at Davey and I said, do you need to go out there? Is there anything you need to ask him? Is there anything you need to do? He said, no. And so I told David that they did not need to come out there and 
hung up. So the, the special agent was directly invited by telephone to go out and see Mr. Koresh personally? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. All right, let me turn to uh, <clears throat> Mr. Goldstein and Mr. Deschamps. Um, there has already been substantial discussion of the search warrant in this case, and if there's time, I would like to go back to that. But before we do, I have a couple of other warrants that were issued, and, and warrants holding up aren't as good a photo opportunity as an AK-47, I know, but they may be more important to this case. There were also a warrant for arrest and a, against Mr. David Koresh, uh, a criminal complaint to go along with that. Have you two gentlemen seen all these documents, Mr. Uh, Goldstein? I'm Mr. Uh, Mr. Desha. I Desha. have seen the affidavits. I've not actually seen the warrant or the complaint. All right, Mr. Goldstein. I, I have been provided with a copy of the search warrant. I have not seen the affidavit for the arrest warrant. Well, let me tell you, the arrest warrant says that uh, it's arrest warrant to United States of America versus Vernon Way Howell, AKA David Koresh, and it gives the number of the Western District of Texas, and it charges him with the following crime, and I'm reading now. It charges him with the lawful possession of a destructive device. Have either of you ever heard of a crime called the lawful possession of a destructive device? I would suggest that would not be a crime. Does the gentleman have Is there a parliamentary inquiry here? Parliamentary inquiry. Does the gentleman have a complete copy of the um, of the warrant? Does, does as far as I know, I do. Apparently, uh, he does. I do. So, if, if you two want to refer to it, you can. But it's the gentleman's. I have a copy that says. The letter N is there, and it looks like the U is not copied. So that it looks like it's unlawful possession on the copy I have. That's fine. Well, but in other words, there's a reading of some of them that think it's unlawful possession is actually printed on there. All right. Well, that's, that's Let me parliamentary inquiry, it's but... It's not on my copy, Mr. Chairman. It says lawful possession. You, have, you have an additional minute to <clears throat> add it back to let, your time, let, Mr. Let Chairman. me go on, then, to the statute number. It's presumably, obviously, it meant to say unlawful possession. Uh, but let me go to the statute number. Uh, it says, in violation of 26 United States Code, section 5845F. Are either of you gentlemen familiar with that particular section of the United States Code? I am not. I've read that statute. All right. Are you aware that that section does not create a crime? It creates a definition of a destructive device and the actual crime of possession of that device illegally is 26 United States Code 5861. You are correct. I believe the citation is to the definitional section of that right. statute. Now, uh, my point is this. Assuming, there, assuming I don't have a <clears throat> miscopied section there, that I've read the section of the code properly there, I'm making the point that isn't it rather sloppy law enforcement work to put the wrong section of a code into a warrant for which somebody is about to be arrested? Uh, Mr. Goldstein, either, either, either one of you first. No question it's sloppy. Uh, I would suggest that on day in and day out, courts affirm arrests of individuals, uh, even though the citation to the code is wrong. Even in convictions are even upheld when an indictment contains the wrong citation. I wasn't asking to the code. if it was legal. I was asking if it was sloppy. Certainly sloppy. All right, Mr. Deschamp, do you have well, a Well, I'd have to say that it's sloppy, although lots of time problems happen with in, in transcription by uh, secretaries and others, and, and it happens all the time, as Mr. Goldstein has said. Well, what I'm, ge what I'm getting at is I, I, that's the, practically the first document in this whole set of events, and I'm suggesting that, it, that starting with the documents and point by point, one can see that law enforcement uh, at various times uh, uh, may have been doing a questionable job. And, I, and I I'd like to go back to the search warrant. If I, I, I would suggest that if they had spent as much time worrying about the warrant as they had been amassing military type uh, equipment to uh, execute the warrant, they probably wouldn't have made those kinds of mistakes. Well, let's, let's talk about the warrant a bit because you, you didn't have time to complete your statements when testifying before. Uh, starting with Mr. Goldstein, do you have any specific observations of the warrant? that you think are substandard. I'm not raising the issue of is it probable cause. That's ultimately a legal determination. But is there anything that you personally question uh, well, in, in that warrant? I think I have stated that uh, there's a lot of surplusage. Uh, there's a lot of inflammatory material in the warrant that 
while it is terrible to read, just like it was terrible to listen to, has little to do with federal law enforcement uh, and is certainly outside of the scope of the jurisdiction of the agency that was trying to get the warrant. Well, I so, would point so, out let, that... Let me, let me stop you right there and just emphasize that. There is some rather graphic sexual tes testimony in the affidavit for the search warrant also. Yes, there is. But the offense for which the search warrant is being drafted is a firearms offense. Is no question, right? and the ATF wouldn't have any jurisdiction to enforce uh, the child sexual laws or pornography right. laws or deviant sexual activity laws of the state of Texas. Well, you know, Mr. John said that if he arrested David Forrest, he was going to take DNA samples for some reason. Do you know for what federal offense he was going to do that for? As I understood Mr. Yan's testimony, he said he was going to turn that over to state authorities, but do that's you, what I heard. Do you know if the state authorities asked for his assistance? I do not. Do you, There's did, a nice did, deputy sheriff sitting next to me, but I, right. I haven't Thank asked you. him. All right. Let's go back to the warrant then. That, that's something you've read. Uh, would you have some other specific examples with respect to use of informants uh, currentness of the of the information. I'll let either of you pick up wherever you wherever you, wherever you wish on that. I just want to stress, I'm not trying to make a, 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 a legal determination if probable cause still exists. I'm trying to get at was due care shown professionally in the drafting of this document. Well, Which let me uh, respond to that if I may, Congressman. Uh, the fact is, officers who draw these uh, applications tend to put in more information oftentimes than, than they necessarily need to simply because they want to make sure that they cover all the bases. And there isn't any doubt that there are some irrelevant, uh, prejudicial material in this application. Uh, but uh, I, I think that it's uh, common for officers to put that in in the hopes that they don't inadvertently leave something out that they should have put in. How Better could, to have too much than not enough. How could sexual information possibly, if left out, have anything to do with a firearms charge? It could. Okay. It's irrelevant. Thank you. Even some of the firearms information, for example, there's a quote that's referred to at least, uh, at least once, I think twice, of, of a child who, was, who had been living in the compound who said, I hope to grow up because then I can practice with long guns like adults. Do either of you know of a federal offense in practicing with long guns by adults? It, it, it's not just that it's irrelevant. It's inflammatory. It, was, it wasn't mistakenly put in there. Someone intentionally put that in there in the hopes that that would move a, a judge, the person that issues the warrant. The problem we all have is that the state of the law right now is that a judge will take, even if you had an outright lie, that you could prove that they had perjured themselves on the affidavit. The judge would simply excise that out, and you'd redact it is what it's redaction, and that's the problem that defense lawyers out there and citizens who want to enforce these rights, which are the way that we actually protect ourselves from unlawful government abuses. All right, let me, let me point out the, the affidavit did mention, since it went into child abuse, that a, that a child caseworker from the state of Texas Human Services Department went out to the compound. Um, that person was allowed in the compound, wasn't restrained or shot in any way. Was that your understanding of the affidavit? That, that is mine, and I, I, I would question both uh, the resort to this kind of amassed military-like force when it does appear that there were a number of other opportunities, but this is hindsight and second Well, guess. we have two things to start off. We have the fact that a Texas government official went out there and went out and returned unmolested, yes. and we have at least a telephone invitation directly to alcohol, tobacco, and firearms to go out. And it, it does appear that David Koresh had been out during that period of time and perhaps could have been apprehended without this, although that doesn't relate to the search of the premises. Right. Um, speak, speaking further on that, was there anything in this affidavit for the search warrant that indicated that exigent circumstances existed so that uh, there had to be a no-knock entry? Did either of you see that? No, but I can tell you this much. Before, interesting enough, Justice Thomas's unanimous opinion in Wilson versus Ar Ar Arkansas, you probably couldn't have found a defense lawyer out there that would have thought that the knock-and-announce provisions of the uh, Fourth Amendment had any teeth in them. Uh, quite see, frankly, you, there is nothing did, in did, there that did would... Did you see them even try to argue exigent circumstances uh, in, the, in this affidavit? Other than the argument that weaponry always presents some danger, right. there is nothing either addressed specifically to exigent circumstances, right. nor is there a, requ a request right. for authorization to, to enter without knocking and announcing. Ju just to conclude then, whenever there's firearms, there's potential danger, right, Mr. Goldstein, in a search? No question. All right, but in every other search, or most other searches, there's not uh, dozens, if not a hundred, militarily trained ATF agents staging the raid either, right? No question. It does appear that they did not do much in the way of availing themselves of less intrusive 
uh, opportunities, and it looks like they spent all of their time uh, amassing uh, military-type equipment to engage in this raid and perhaps even lied to state and federal officers and officials to obtain that equipment. Okay. Thank you. No further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schumer, you're recognized for 15 minutes. Uh, thank you, and I didn't intend to get off on this. But Mr. Goldstein, where, what military-type equipment were used in the raid we're talking about? I well, don't know of a single, uh, single the, instance. The helicopters and other uh, uh, aircraft that would not normally be assigned to the police department, I would suggest that they are not military in the sense mm -hmm. that they are unique to military. Here's what concerns me, and I'm not saying police, the NYPD, I don't know, out in Texas, all have helicopters. They don't borrow them from the National Guard and say what is that, that there's what, what does that have to do with it? Well, because it goes to what we're talking, the callousness or the, or the concerns I think many of us have okay. to irregularity. Yeah. Other than helicopters, was there any other military equipment used? Uh, uh, if you're suggesting that... I'm just asking a yes or no question, Counselor. Yes, I think that we don't what? need... What the, was it? I think the the military style Wait, uh, attire. Wait, you said lots of oh, military style attire. Yes, okay. I think that okay. I have a concern. I finished this line of questioning. I, I uh, that's fine. Military style attire. I think the ninja indicated. mask, the the right. black. Do you know is that standard ATF procedure? I think it is becoming more and more standard in not only ATF right. but and law you... enforcement, even down to our local okay. law enforcement. It's one of the things Thank that you, I Mr. think Goldstein. defense lawyers are concerned about. I'm not interested in your general views on what type of attire police and ATF ought to wear. I think every okay, law enforcement please, agency Mr. Goldstein, is now using. That's enough. I have a series of questions here. Uh, I just you hadn't read the affidavit and yet you were commenting on what happened there and led to the led people to a conclusion that was all sorts of military types of things and now we find out it's the typical ATF uniforms and a helicopter. I don't think ninja My question is now to Mr. Barber. Um, and what I'd like to establish here uh, with you, um, uh, Lieutenant Barber, and is uh, that the ATF just didn't pick this place out of the clear blue. Um, that and first, let me just uh, introduce you to the panel that you are a uh, member of the, uh, you were a member of the McLennan County Sheriff's Office uh, at the, uh, during this time, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. When did you first become aware of the problems at the Branch Davidian compound? The first notification I had had nothing to do. You can just pull the microphone closer. Thank you. The first notification that uh, our department got involved with actually came through the Immigration and Naturalization Service. When was that? Uh, 1990. Mm -hmm. And this had to do with the possibility of uh, illegal aliens being out there, having overstayed right. their visas, et cetera. Was there any knowledge about the 1987 shootout involving George Roden with your uh, department? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, I was one of the arresting officers uh, that took uh, Vernon and his people into custody that day. I see. And, and, and just in a thumbnail sketch, tell us what happened at that shootout as best you know. I was the uh, third vehicle to arrive, and uh, at that time they had everyone in custody, and I was a weapons officer for our department. I uh, made the weapons safe, cleared them, and the people were uh, transported downtown. Right. And then I conducted an inventory of the weapons and uh, all the ammunition that they had. Right, and Koresh in that was charged uh, with serious crimes, I believe, including attempted murder. Yes, sir, I believe so. And ended in a hung jury. Yes, sir. Okay. In his case, an acquittal on the others. Correct. Okay, now after that time, did you receive complaints about activities at the Branch Davidian compound? In particular, did you receive complaints about automatic weapons? Yes, sir. Uh, there were some people that lived close by said that they thought that they had heard automatic weapons fire there and wanted us to check on it. And I said, well, we can't post someone out there. Uh, and this were neighbors complaining, yes. hearing automatic yes. weapon fire. Incidentally, we had asked, and in general, the process has been fair, but we had asked that that gentleman be a witness and were not allowed that witness. Why? I'm not sure. Um, the one who actually heard the automatic weapons fire because he was a neighbor of Mr. Koresh. Um, okay, how about did you, uh, did a UPS agent talk to you about other things that were delivered to the compound? Could you tell us a little about that? 
Uh, first of all, he talked to our chief deputy, uh, Captain Dan Weinberg, uh, concerning the grenades that well, have been mentioned tell us quite this. a bit. What, is, what, what was this with grenades? Uh, seems like a box of uh, Mark II type pineapple grenades, if you will. Uh, the box had broken open somewhere in shipment with UPS, and uh, that was reported to the captain. And uh, he asked me if I had any knowledge of it. I said, no. He said, well, you're also our uh, bomb technician. I want you to work with uh, UPS on this and uh, just see what they're doing with them. If you can so find UPS out. came to you and said, we've seen this. Uh, tell us if there's a problem. Yes, sir. They came to the okay. Sheriff's Department. Did you, were you also aware of not only uh, shipments of these grenade cases, which we've heard the only possible use is for paperweights, uh, from the other side, although I have never seen one used as a paperweight in my limited experience. Um, and hear about shipments of uh, materials that might be used in those grenades to make them explosive? Yes, sir. Could you tell us a little about that? One of the shipments uh, consisted of uh, aluminum powder. Aluminum powder, often used in grenades. Well, no, sir, not necessarily. It had to be mixed with other compounds. Magnesium? And uh, magnesium and potassium nitrate. Right. Okay. Um, let me ask you this. Why did you, you were the one, I presume, who called ATF and asked them to get involved. Is that correct? Uh, the captain called first, and then I was put over as liaison with ATF. Okay. So the captain of the McLennan County Sheriff's Department called ATF. Yes, sir. ATF, just to underscore, did not come in on their own. They were called by local law enforcement. They were called in and asked to come in. Right. Do you often call ATF on matters uh, in your county? When we determined the uh, extent of the shipments that were coming in from all over the United States, that was beyond our capabilities. Did you regard this as unusual and fairly serious, and is that why you called ATF? Apprehensive. You were apprehensive. And let me ask you this question, sir. Um, were, were the people in Waco worried about the compound? What was the general talk in the community? At that time, there was none. Mm -hmm. uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I don't live too terribly far from the compound. And uh, the people out there just said, well, you know, the people are a little bit different, but that was it. Right. So the, um, what brought your apprehension were the shipments of various weapons, grenades, components, and things like that. In conjunction with the prior occurrence in 1987. Right. And again, it was the local government, not the federal government, that called ATF to the problem. ATF did not originate. That's correct. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Barber. We appreciate your coming a long way out here. My next uh, bunch of uh, questions now is uh, to Mr. Mm -hmm. Ray, Mr. Deschamps. Am I pronouncing your name right? Pronounce it Deschamps. Deschamps. Well, don't pronounce the. You're from the Missoula, P. Montana. Yeah. I'm from Brooklyn, Close New York. Enough. I apologize for the for the uh, discrepancy in pronunciation. But you are the president of the National District Attorneys Association, as well as the DA for Missoula County, Montana. That's, uh, Is that that's correct? correct. Okay. Uh, as, a, as a district attorney for Missoula County, I presume you've prepared or reviewed a large number of warrant applications. Yes, and thinking about this, I think I've prepared uh, probably 5,000 arrest warrants and a couple thousand search warrants. Okay. And have you reviewed the search and arrest warrants, uh, as well as the accompanying affidavits in this situation? I have. And let me ask you, based on your many years of experience, the 5,000 warrants uh, that you have uh, issued, do you believe there was the sufficient probable cause for the magistrate, in this case Magistrate Green, to have issued the warrants to search the Branch Davidian compound and absolutely. to arrest David Corris? Absolutely. Explain absolutely. This wasn't, a, this wasn't one of those little borderline cases, despite the huge amount of extraneous material and despite certain erroneous material, sloppy material, as Mr. Uh, Goldstein described it in relation to uh, uh, Mr. Schiff's questioning. Is that correct? That's correct. This was probable, not a borderline. Probable cause simply means enough evidence to, to persuade a neutral and detached magistrate that the items sought are probably there. And I think any reasonable person reading this would say beyond any question the items sought were probably there. Right. Now we heard Mr. Goldstein say that the standards are probably too loose or whatever else and I'm sure there would be many more on my side who would generally agree with that than on the other side but the law, the status of the law would be quite clear that this would be 
uh, that this would clearly be within the ambit of the law, this search warrant. Yes. No doubt about that. No doubt at all in my okay, mind. Okay, Mr. Goldstein, I just, I want to continue on this, but my third point here is that at the criminal trial of the Branch Davidians who survived, some of the, they had excellent attorneys, and they some, didn't even some mention. Some of the best. Pardon? Some of the best. Some of the best. You're familiar with people like Jack Zimmerman, Dick DeGarren, and Tim Evans. I grew up with them, know them, some of them are in the room as we speak. Well, welcome wherever you are. Um, and these are excellent attorneys. First rate. Okay. Now, I just want it clear for the record that at that trial, which would have been the logical place to challenge these warrants, that there was no such challenge. Absolutely uh, wait, right. I'm not asking you the question, Mr. Goldstein. You're the witness from the other side. I want to ask our witness, Mr. Sure. Uh, although you've been pretty good for our side. I don't <laughs> deny that. Uh, but in any case, um, Mr. I'm sorry, Deschamps? Deschamps? Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What's his first name? What's his first name? Rob. If I can call you Robert, you can call me Chuck. Oh, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> Um, wouldn't you find it, if there were some colorable doubt and there were excellent attorneys involved in the case, wouldn't you find it strange that they would not bring this issue up at uh, the initial trial? I would find it strange. Generally speaking, they were going to throw everything but the kitchen sink in there, hoping that uh, if there's even a chance uh, that uh, they've got to raise it to preserve it for appeal. Right. And so the fact that these excellent, outstanding attorneys, in, in the words of Mr. Goldstein, who has known some of them since he was a child, didn't bring this up, would probably be far more dispositive of what is a good search warrant than you would think the author of a book or an expert on religion or a non-lawyer. Would that be a pretty good uh, guess? I would say yes. Okay. Um, and finally, and we'll hear more about that later. But again, I want, just want to underscore to everybody, a huge issue is the warrants. Now, one final point, and that is that it is undispute, indisputable that some 48 illegal automatic machine guns, you may not call them, I noticed in the dialogue, Mr. Barr didn't want to refer to them as machine guns, although an automatic weapon can be, but let's just call them automatic weapons and grenades were found there. So it actually proved, Ms. Uh, Robert, that the presumptions of Mr. Aguilera, that the probable um, cause that he sought proved to be true in retrospect. Is that right? Absolutely. Not way off the deep end for sure. No. Not just one weapon found, not just one hand grenade, but many, many weapons and many, many hand grenades. That's true. And let me just ask you this, that the elements of the case, not only all the various, I, I heard somebody, uh, uh, Mr. Revis, the learned attorney, um, uh, talk about, well, the hacksaw analogy. But you also had a history of violence. You also had neighbors who had heard both rapid automatic weapons fire, including somebody who's a former Marine who knew what automatic weapons fire was. You had a, an apocalyptic theory plus a huge amount of weapons that brought uh, Lieutenant Barber and the McLennan Sheriff's Department to do the unusual step of calling in the ATF. All of that together seems a pretty good case. I would in, think so. In, in, in prospect, and in retrospect, 48 weapons, many hand grenades were found. So, hmm? would you take that case? I certainly would, yes. Yeah. I mean... It seems to me that this issue, there are some issues, and we'll get into some of those down the road, may be open to some dispute. But I think, and it seems pretty clear to me, that on the issue of the warrant, both in reality, 48 weapons, many hand grenades, both and in prospect, lots of various evidence, it seems pretty clear that nobody did anything wrong at all, let alone in a conspiratorial way to get somebody. Fair enough, Mr. Robert? I, I, I think it's fair enough, and I, I guess in view of events of recent times, yeah, we, had a, we had a couple 
hundred pounds of high explosives in there that right. I, I think couldn't hardly be ignored. Uh, in fact, quite anything else. I can think of situations where if the prosecuting authority, whether it be ATF, McLennan, Sheriff, or anybody else, had all this evidence and didn't look for a warrant, there'd be outcries from everybody. So, final question to you, Robert, and that is, is it even if, even if the warrant were illegally executed, even if ATF could have found a better way to do it, and we'll get into that on the next panel, because remember, folks, this is a search warrant. You don't, and just maybe, Robert, you could just corroborate this from your experience. When you want to search a place, you don't usually go serve somebody or arrest them off the premises since you don't want them to, don't want the place to have destroyed the evidence. You don't, right? Isn't that correct? The proper procedure when you do a search warrant is to serve it at the place you're searching? Absolutely. In fact, uh, I think the law requires that you leave a copy right. at Not the place you Not when search. someone's jogging or getting ice cream or <laughs> visiting another place. You serve the place. That's right. And the proper response of a citizen, no matter how angry at the federal government, no matter what religious theory they might ascribe to, no matter how sloppy the search warrant is, is what, Robert? Is well, it to accept the warrant? Accept it and challenge it in court later. And you agree with that, Mr. Goldstein, I presume? I would agree, and I think there's a reason why good lawyers would not challenge this warrant. Okay. And I would say it certainly is not the correct thing to do is to either threaten or shoot at those who seek to ser serve that warrant. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. In fact, it's uh, highly illegal to do that. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your time is up, and now we enter our five-minute period of questioning. Uh, on the right side over here, the first five-minute questioner is Mr. Blute. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all of the uh, witnesses for their testimony. They've been here a long time, and we appreciate it. And uh, uh, I would like to uh, get into something with Mr. Thibodeau, because I know uh, it's our understanding that you can't be here uh, later in the in the hearings to deal with the actual day of the raid. Is After the 21st, I can be here anytime you need me. Well, but if you're not going to be here Friday, is that correct? Uh, uh, yeah, that's correct. Okay. Well, since you can't be here Friday, I would like to get into the record if I could because you're one of the witnesses who was actually there uh, the day of the February raid. Uh, were you not? Yes. You were there. Uh, could you uh, take some minutes in describing what happened that day, what you saw happen starting in the morning? In the morning of that day, I was in the cafeteria area of the building and eating breakfast. And um, I, after breakfast, I took a walk down the hall. And I got down to the hall, and David Koresh was sitting there with Robert Rodriguez, uh, who we know to be the undercover agent now. Robert Rodriguez was sitting there talking with Dave, and he had been over quite a bit, I would say, on uh, eight or nine separate occasions. So I didn't really think too much about this. Now, the, the night before this, the day before this, the Waco Tribune Herald had started to print the Sinful Messiah series, the seven-part series. So obviously there was concern over that. And, you know, David uh, did kind of view that as the beginning of the end, but obviously we didn't know how soon this was going to take place. Um, just really quick, if I may say, David's hope was still that the music would go forward. He wanted to get his message out through the music, and he was hoping that, this, that if this were an undercover agent, he always gave the gentleman the benefit of the doubt, um, he would see where Koresh is coming from, from another side, from a scriptural side, and perhaps uh, go to his superiors and try to uh, talk to them about this other aspect. Did but you have some sense that this person was an undercover agent yourself? Yes, I did. You had heard that in the compound? Well, not so much heard it. Well, Wayne Martin was really suspicious, and he had the he he checked him out. Uh, the thing that was kind of the giveaway for me. I mean, here are these guys. There's four or five of them living over in a two-room apartment. Uh, you know, they have forty-thousand-dollar automobiles, Serengeti sunglasses, Rolex watches. And they're coming over claiming to be college students. You know, I, I guess the plot kind of thickens when when they say that they're going to TSTC, which is a technical college. You know, you go for maintenance things like that. And I asked Robert at one point, you know, just casually, because I, I spoke to Robert on a, on a number of occasions. I said, you know, Robert, what, um, what, what classes have you taken? And he said, philosophy. And I, I basically thought that that was pretty funny, you know. Um, but anyway, Wayne Martin did, I guess he checked some license plates and found that they were registered to 
to a Dallas somewhere. It was Dallas or Houston, I'm not sure exactly. But the story just really didn't check out. And, you know, Wayne, Wayne Martin was really paranoid over it. I remember him, like, being So nervous. it was a common suspicion in the compound that Rodriguez was not what he said he was. Yes. From early on. Yes. Okay. David's whole attitude. Yeah, continue whole, on that day. Continue on that day. David's whole attitude with that was, well, you know, even if he is working with the government, even if he's with the National Guard, it doesn't matter. You know, I have a truth here that is being presented. It's going to be presented. And hopefully this person will, will see something that the other people, from an, an, you know, not having the experience of one-on-one -on -one with David, you cannot see. So that was the hope. Um, that day I saw them talking. I didn't think much of it. And I went back. Let me just uh, speed you up to the time of, where were you when the raid began? I was in the cafeteria. I started to hear the helicopters coming from the back of the building. It was very faint. Koresh came down the stairs. Um, my recollection is that Koresh was not armed. There were some people around Koresh. There was, I would say, quite a few, five or six. And there was a lot of doors slamming throughout the building at this point. It just seemed like an, a lot of action was taking place at once. And David held his hand up. At this point, there were, there were people coming in from uh, the other area of the building. I, I wish I, I have a diagram, but they were coming in from uh, where, the, um, where the dormitories were for the men. They came into the cafeteria. David held his hand up and he said, now, okay, they're coming, they're on their way. But this was uh, after the helicopter noise was this, audible. Yeah, this is, we can hear the helicopter and it's getting louder and louder. He well, said, when did you first see the helicopter? Did you see the helicopters? I did not see the helicopters personally, uh, but they were very loud, they were very clear. And, and uh, we've heard testimony, I have to finish here, but that the uh, helicopters came a significant period of time before the raiding party. Is that your sense of what happened? My sense of what happened from where I was is after David Koresh made that statement, he said, don't do anything stupid. We want to talk to these people. We want to work it out. That's what we're all about here at Mount Carmel. And I'll never forget those words because I was really scared. And when I heard that, it, you know, it was like, okay, David's going to try to talk to him. Maybe this can still be avoided. He went to the front door. Now, from where I was in the cafeteria, it sounded to me like the shots were emulating from the front, okay? Now, I talked to Renis Abraham later and a couple of the other survivors. Renis particularly, testimony was very strong. I said, you know, Reddit, this is considerably after hours later, maybe even a couple days later. Time really was kind of like a tunnel vision type thing. But I talked to Renis, and Renis said, you know, I said, you know, Renis, uh, what did you think of all that firing just starting at the front door? And Renis said, it didn't. I said, what do you mean? He said, I was outside, and I saw the helicopters coming in, and I saw fire coming from the helicopters into the tower area, and it initiated with the helicopters firing. I so you I you said, didn't see that yourself? No, I did not. people there uh, told you that on yes. that day? Yes, and I said, Renis, are you sure? Because it didn't go with my experience from what I heard. It sounded to me like the front door. And he said, I am positive, which indicates to me that it was simultaneous, that you had the group at the front and the group at the back, and the only way that that could have occurred is if it all occurred together. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think this is very important testimony. Uh, Mr. Thibodeau has a statement outlining uh, what he thinks and what he saw happen on that day, which I think is very important uh, that I hope uh, we can get into the record. Thank well, you. Mr. Certainly any uh, written testimony Mr. Thibodeau would like to make will be admitted to the record without objection. Uh, yes, Mr. Taylor. Are we dealing with hearsay evidence here? And I'm not an attorney, but when someone is using secondhand testimony... Well, parliamentary inquiry uh, is uh, taken. We, uh, in court uh, proceedings, you might be able to not have hearsay in it, but in congressional hearings, hearsay is admissible. There is nothing that prohibits that. Mr. Chairman, to continue my inquiry, will the record clearly indicate <coughs> that this is secondhand testimony? Well, it obviously does. You've just made Thank it you very much, that sir. way. <laughs> Mr. Scott. Five, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, Mr. Goldstein, I want to get away from the particulars of this case for a second and go into some generalities and ask you to explain how the, um, in, in your written testimony, you go into the Fourth Amendment. And I'd like you to say for a minute or so how the exclusionary rule protects innocent people from police misconduct. The exclusionary rule was, is a judicially crafted rule uh, that, in effect, precludes from the introduction into evidence any items or evidence that was obtained by the police illegally. I think the general citizenry out there thinks that liberal courts are unleashing violent criminals on the citizenry to beat up on them. In actual fact, less than one-half of one percent 
of the citizens charged in this country ever benefit from a motion to suppress. But the theory is that by excluding illegally obtained evidence, evidence that law officers obtain in violation of the supreme law of the land, that that will deter them from engaging in that illegal conduct because they won't want to go out and obtain evidence illegally if they know they can't use it. And, and the, so import, I, the importance is that while it only benefits one half of one percent of those charged and many of them may be innocent, everyone benefits from it because the general discouragement of illegal police activity protects you and me and the innocent citizens out there whose homes are not intruded upon. So it has a, it protects a hundred percent of the innocent citizens and only benefits a small infinitesimal percentage of those who may in fact be guilty. Now, if you have an allegation of police misconduct or illegal uh, activity on the part of the police in obtaining evidence, uh, prior to 1984, where in the Leon case, what part of the judicial proceeding would you argue the case that, it was, that the evidence was illegally obtained? It would be at a pretrial motion, Mr. Scott, uh, uh, through a motion to suppress. What's interesting is, uh, um, Mr. Taylor's point, uh, hearsay evidence would be admissible at a suppression hearing. Uh, it wouldn't matter that there wasn't probable cause uh, because, in fact, according to Leon, the, after 1984, the, well, let's, the let's do officers before, could... Before 1984. Prior to that time, you would be... In fact, the, the instances like this, uh, uh, these kinds of issues would be viable prior to 1984. Now, after Leon and the good faith exception, uh, how has it... How has your ability to challenge police misconduct been compromised? Well, that's what I wanted to answer to Mr. Schumer. No good defense lawyer with his head screwed on right is going to file a motion to suppress where there's a warrant simply because the officers are entitled to rely upon the warrant even if it's totally lacking in probable cause. And even if there's a lie because in order to meet the standard of Franks versus Delaware, which is a hard standard to prove, you're going to have to prove, in fact, by sworn testimony that there's a lie before you can even call a witness, before you'll get a hearing, before you can ask a single question. So what, what I'm going to ask is, nobody wants to hear this apparently, is if we're going to have anything out of this hearing that's going to regulate and control illegal police practices, what we need to do is put some teeth back in the Fourth Amendment and give the citizenry some means of protecting themselves. Let me get to the particulars of this case, uh, Robert. Uh, if you could show now, I think in this case, there's plenty of evidence to support the, um, the search. You've got the USPS testimony. You've got statements from arms dealers of what, was, what had gone in. You've got statements from neighbors. You've got plenty there. But if you could show that this warrant had been obtained by irrelevant, inflammatory, and unreliable evidence, uh, what could a innocent person, if we're going to discourage searches of innocent people, how could any of the defendants in this case have brought up a challenge to the evidence? Uh, frankly, I'm not sure that they... I, I'm not sure that they... Well, they could have brought up a motion to suppress. They certainly could have asked for a Franks hearing to show that there was... Uh, if, if there are lies in there, and I don't see any, but suppose there were, that would be their uh, one remedy they have. Uh, I have to disagree with Mr. Goldstein it, it isn't an automatic silver platter that you get a uh, judicially issued warrant if the officer himself knows. There's plenty of recent case law on this uh, point. If, if the searching if the officer if knows that it's based on time is almost lies. up. If the searching officer didn't know about all the irregularities, how would they be able to bring this up in a hearing? Through, through, a, through a Franks hearing to show that there were inappropriate, illegal... Uh, uh, lies, uh, falsehoods that uh, led to the probable cause. Which, in order to get that, you're going to have to be able to demonstrate that by sworn affidavit. How do you get that if you haven't been able to call or ask a questionable witness? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Scott, thank you. Mr. Bryant, for five minutes. Get the same extra minute Mr. Mr. Chairman, Duke before my five minutes starts, I would ask unanimous consent to submit an opening statement for the record. It uh, is granted without objection. Thank you. As a former United States attorney, I had uh, a very positive experience with law enforcement in, in my area with ATF and the FBI. But I have uh, some very grave concerns about the environment that existed in Waco uh, in February of 1993 that apparently compelled uh, this raid to occur that day. And as such, I wanted to ask just a few questions and maybe bounce around a little bit and tie up some loose ends. Uh, Mr. Thibodeau, are you familiar with a Mark Bro? Yes. Uh, does Mr. Bro have any uh, 
physical impairment? Yes, uh, he has a significant sight impairment. Uh, my understanding, he's legally blind. Okay. Uh, I bring up Mr. Bro because as a part of the basis for this search warrant, the uh, agent affirms under oath that uh, he interviewed Mr. Bro in Los Angeles and that Mr. Bro indicated he actually shot weapons and, and performed guard duty uh, with a loaded weapon. He, he also used to tell stories about um, swim, swimming for sharks and, you know, being, he used to tell some whoppers, let me put it that way, according to Steve Schneider and some of the other people that I used to speak to about Mr. Bro's experience in the past. You know, nothing bad or, you know, just that's, he was a kind of a storyteller, yeah. It was the impression I had. Thank you. Uh, again, as a, as a former prosecutor, I don't mean to concede, and I certainly don't, that Mr. Koresh's actions were proper in his reaction uh, to the service of this warrant. I think he had an obligation to uh, respond lawfully and challenge it in the courts. I disagree totally with that action. But I, as I said before, I'm concerned about other issues that, uh, from the other side. Uh, Mr. McMahon, uh, Mr. Koresh uh, did go to gun shows and deal in firearms and uh, uh, grenades and paperweights and so forth. Is that correct? I, I never seen any hand grenades, but I've seen uh, upper receivers, uh, knives, uh, accessories, magazines. I mean, he had, a, you know, he went to gun shows and he advertised even. I mean, here's one of his business cards. I mean, I'm sure y'all have seen all these. I'd like to put that in the record if I could. Sure. But when I say hand grenades, I mean empty shells that are used on vests. And are you familiar with that practice of putting them on vests or using them as paperweights? Yes, sir, I am. That's a, uh, I'm, I'm really surprised that, the, that uh, Mr. Schumer didn't say that before. I mean, everybody's seen the pull pin complaint department, you know, pin number one. But uh, that is a common practice at gun shows, yes, sir. Uh, Deputy Barber, I understand you're retired now from the uh, county sheriff's office. Yes, sir, that's correct. Uh, and you were uh, familiar with the Koresh people? Uh, to a degree, yes. And were you consulted uh, by the ATF before this raid occurred on February 28, 1993? Yes, I was. Uh, were you familiar with the, the fact that they were, as a part of the Davidians out there, uh, I, what I understand to be a number of elderly people and a number of, obviously, we know at least 20 children. Did you know they were out there? Yes, I did. Uh, did you make this fact known to the ATF, or did they already know that? I feel they already knew that. Uh, let me ask you if I could. Are you familiar at all with, uh, were you familiar with the fact that Mr. Koresh was, uh, was dealing in guns at gun shows? I had not seen him at a gun show uh, there in Waco. I had seen Paul Fata. Is it normally the practice of ATF to also monitor and attend these various gun shows as just as a practice? I can't tell you what their practices are. Uh, Mr. Goldstein, uh, let me follow up. I'd understood it before that you had expressed an opinion that because of what you perceive as the misapplication of law to the facts of this case and, and the, the staleness, and I don't think our, our uh, fellow prosecutor talked about the staleness of this information, uh, the age of it, and because of uh, perhaps the uh, lack of credibility on some of these witnesses who, who talked to the agent, that you had some grave concerns about the validity of that search warrant. It is true, Mr. Bryan. I am concerned any time there's that kind of lapse of time between the date of the information and the date that the warrant is actually sought to be executed, because I think there's always a danger there that even if it existed, it won't be there when they go. I was concerned. Could I cut you off just a minute Sir. and ask one quick question back to Mr. Barber? Do you know what occurred in, in February that, that compelled the ATF to go in that day on February the 28th, even when the element of surprise was, was lost? Why they had to go in at that time? No, sir, I do not. I do know that the uh, raid, as it's being referred to, was scheduled for the following Monday. I was aware of that. And they moved it forward a week? and they moved it forward one day. Okay, right, right Sunday. Thank you. Running to my list, uh, Ms. Lofgren, you're next up for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd like to, um, to thank the attorney for being here today and for uh, telling her how proud I am of her to be here and to speak up, and it's not easy for anybody, even a grown-up, 
to come and testify, and uh, I think you're a pretty special young lady, and you're doing something important for your country. I, um, in reading and listening to you, you note that there were uh, other, some other girls. Uh, your written statement mentions a uh, little Esther that your mother had mentioned, and also Rachel. Were you aware that other little girls were being molested by Mr. Koresh? Did yeah. you know about that? And you probably don't know about this, although maybe you do, and I'll ask a question. There was a doctor, uh, Perry, who I think we'll get into that later in the panel, who in um, March contacted the FBI and talked about some of the other little girls who had been involved and in, had been abused by Mr. Korsh, and they reported um, uh, to him information about wirings and explosions and things of that nature. Did you ever hear about uh, guns or weapons or explosions, uh, or did you know anything about that? Um, yeah, guns. Uh I never saw any explosions. Uh, I remember one time I was in David's room above the kitchen. This was before they rebuilt the whole compound, but it was above the kitchen. And he pulled out this gun that had to have been, I don't know, it was, it was huge. It was huge. I mean, I, of course, was like eight, so it probably was a little bit bigger, but it was huge. It the just the bullets itself were had to have been like this big, with nails that came like this on each side of the bullet to keep it together, just like yeah on, on a chain like rows and rows of them, and they were just coiled up in his drawers. Yeah, like Rambo. <laughs> um, it. It was incredible. It was just, and he was proud of it. It was his toy. It was his little, it was his new toy that he had just gotten, and he was showing it off. Now, in February, you and your dad went and spoke to um, the federal agents. And what did you tell them? Do you remember what you said to them? I th or maybe I misunderstood when you answered Karen Thurman earlier. Which part? Did you, um, in February, go and speak to the uh, federal agents, either the FBI or ATF. Do you remember what you talked to about with About them? being molested. That's about what I remember about the children there, who the children's father was. Just that it was mostly about the children. Now, this is, um, the, the deputy sheriff said the first call that they got uh, had to do with the Immigration Service. Do you know anything about marriages or uh, that could have been arranged by Mr. Korish to avoid yeah, the immigration they were law? arranged. Can you tell us anything? Which, which names? Marriages? Well, I don't know if we need names, but can you tell us what you knew and how you knew it? Like I said before, I listened and remembered. Um, there, were, uh, I could name right now at least five marriages that were arranged so that people could stay in the country. All right. At least five. Now, you, uh, thank God, were not in the compound on the, on the day of the raid, but you mentioned in your statement that you were on the phone uh, frequently with your mom, and she was uh, uh, pointing out that you would lose your place to Rachel and that sort of thing. The impression that you got from talking to your mother and what you saw when when you were available to see things. How does that jibe with the statement that Mr. Thibodeau made that gives a more serene picture that things would be settled uh, peaceably? What was your impression of what was going to happen, and why did you think, uh, as you stated earlier, that it would end uh, with no one coming out and with suicides? Because it was always, there was always some sort of violence, not inside the compound, but the whole time you were there, you were prepared to die. The whole time. One time my mom picked me up from the library. I was probably nine. And she said, are you ready to go? And I said, where? And she said, to Israel, we're going to Jerusalem. And I said, OK. <laughs> I wasn't going to leave her. But she said, OK, I just wanted to see if you were ready to go. And you were always ready 
for something. Always had the little scared something inside of you. Finally, uh, there were the first panel of witnesses talked about this uh, whole issue as a matter of religious freedom. Were you ever uh, given a religious rationale for the molestation that was ongoing with the little girls in the complex? Was there a reason given? The only thing I remember was that he would say that King David from the Bible would sleep with young virgins to keep him warm. And something about Psalms 45, I think it was, um, something in there justified all of what, all of the molestation. I don't know, there could have been something else he found that justified it, but that was what I remember. Cause, thank you, Carrie, and thank okay. you for your bravery. Thank you. Thank you. Your time is up, Ms. Lofgren. I note from the minorities list that we had incorrectly let you have that time at that moment. Ms. Slaughter was supposed to get it, but I'm told we're going to correct that because Mr. Schumer is going to yield to Ms. Slaughter in a minute. But where we are at the stage of these proceedings is the time where we have the ranking members and the chairman uh, have their opportunity to question or to yield to somebody for asking questions. And I'm going to take uh, my five minutes at this point in time, uh, and then I will yield to Mr. Schumer, who I guess will yield to Ms. Slaughter. I want to ask uh, Mr. Thibodeau a question. Uh, you were there the day of the raid, and you were there all the way through the fire at the very end, were you not? Yes, sir. Can you tell us anything about how the fire began? <laughs> Here's a couple. This is how I look at it, and, and I put this in the report. Okay. Um, at around 12 o'clock, after being CS gas the entire day, after having a black leather jacket on, seeing little white spots all over it that were absorbed into the jacket, finally, I heard someone yell from the upstairs, can I prerequisite this for, some, for something that happened at 10.30 that I think is very important? At 10.30 that day, I was listening to the radio, and a news report came on. And the news report was saying the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas is being assaulted, and Janet Reno is okay to tear gas plan. Due to the credit of the FBI, they have not fired back when the Davidians on the inside had returned 80 to 200 gunshots against the CEVs. And all I want to say is I was in a fairly central, I mean, I was in the chapel area. And I had heard shots fired accidentally throughout the course of the 51 days, and you could hear them throughout the building. And I did not hear any shots that morning fired. And I was overwhelmed with, with joy at this point after being gassed that my, that my friends were not firing at these tanks because obviously that, that the FBI were saying if you fire us, we're going, we're going, we are going to fire back and not just see us canisters or ferret rounds. So I remember being overwhelmed that my friends were not stupid enough to fire at a tank because a 223 round wasn't going to penetrate it anyway. Well, what about the fire? W okay. What I was saying is to me that appeared like a setup, a setup for a massacre, and it greatly disturbed me. At that point, I'd lost all hope. At 12 o'clock, someone yelled from the upstairs that there was a fire. The front, I could not get to the front because of what the tanks had come in, the stairwell that, I, that was closest to the front, so I went to the stairwell in the back. At this point, and I have some pictures available, uh, the back of the gym was thoroughly destroyed. The tank went in and actually leveled the back of the gym area, the, the, uh, if you're facing the gym, the right half of it. So I went halfway up the stairwell, and I could see the door, but I couldn't get to it because there was this huge beam in, from in, in front of me and debris everywhere. However, David, David Koresh's room was on this side. I could put my elbow up on, on the floor of the second story. I climbed up. It took me quite some time to climb over the debris without getting cut. I went to his room. I went to his room and then to an adjacent room, which was an office space. I got in that room, and there was a catwalk that was leading over the rafters of the church area, say from here to here, which is the front of the building. This is the front of the building. I walked to the front, and I got, we were still in the process of building Mount Carmel. I got to a blanket. I opened the blanket up. A big gust of smoke came at me. When that dissipated, I went to stick my head inside there, because I'm thinking the kids. I'm thinking Serenity C. Jones. I was thinking of Isaiah and Joseph, some of these kids that I've come to know and love, and getting them into the bus, an underground bus that was buried, because I was under the impression that that was the plan. I get up there. I open it. After the smoke dissipates, I go to stick my head in, and a wall of flame shoots down the hallway in front of my face down to the other end of the building. It was the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life. I'm a drummer. And it was very, it was incredibly loud. I could not hear anything else other than this flame. Well, do you know how the fire started? Do you, did anybody tell you, or do you know personally how the fire started? No. Was there any plan for the fire to be started that you heard? No. It, you know, we've heard tapes. All right. I want to go to you very quickly, Mr. Barber. 
Uh, box of grenades that came from UPS, those were dud grenades, not live armed ones. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. They were practice grenades. Uh, methamphetamine lab, do you ever know anything about a methamphetamine lab out of the compound? Uh, there was a rumor of one prior to... Uh, Three or four years prior to this. Though, yes, right? this would have been back in probably uh, 87. But not current with the raid or current with the time Ar Argulia or the ATF were going after these folks, right? No. All right, I want to ask a question, Mr. McMahon, very briefly. Uh, in the book that Mr. Revis has written, Revis has written, he talks about your having a relationship with David Koresh to sell guns or through the compound to have a, have a uh, uh, refitting of guns or putting together a certain type of weapons that you all have made an arrangement or an accommodation to sell them weapons over time. Uh, do you know anything about that? Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? I, I think what he's referring to is uh, there was this deal that, I, that we did. I, I bought the frames and he bought the upper receivers. And David put them together, and then I turned around and sold them. Uh, there was a total of five or six guns that I had sold that way. Was this an ongoing arrangement, or was this a, something that just happened once uh, and it didn't happen again? It had just started when ATF came and did a compliance check, and I explained to them exactly what was going on. And they said that they had a problem with the excise tax. They said the excise tax had to be paid. And I'm going, I don't know anything about this excise tax. And uh, after they left, we uh, stopped doing it. We didn't do it anymore. Only sold us five or six guns, and that was the only time. All right. Well, I, I thank you for those comments. Now I'm going to turn to Mr. Schumer. I've had my five minutes. I gather you're going to yield yours to Ms. Slaughter, but you get the privilege of doing that. My pleasure to yield my five minutes to my friend, colleague, and able legislator, Ms. Slaughter of upstate New York. You're recognized for five thank minutes. Thank you very much. Mr. Tivigo, yes, uh, are you married? No. Did, are you involved in a personal relationship, or have you been with Mr. Koresh's sister-in-law, Michelle? The personal relationship that you're referring to is I had a, a, a large hand in taking care of Serenity C. Jones and uh, her other twin daughters. Did you, you live together? No, we did not live together. We lived in the same building. So, yeah, in a sense, we lived together. Uh, is she the same Michelle Jones that Mr. Koresh referred to as his favorite wife, and had she been with him since she was 12 years old? I have no knowledge of him referring to Michelle as his favorite wife and I being since 12 years old. She has, I believe, three children? Yes. How old are they? Three, and the other ones were uh, twins, uh, approximately one. Are they children of Mr. Koresh? Yes. And he admitted that? Yes. All right. Uh, Mr. Thibodeau, did you live at Mount Carmel? Yes, I did. Uh, and were you, you were there then on the day, February 28th? Yes. And the testimony that we have indicates that there was a 45-minute notice that the ATF was coming. Is that correct? Well, I believe that some people had a majority of prior notice, that there was some kind of prior no notice, but not everybody did. My example of that would be Winston Blake, who was found with a piece of French toast in his hand laying on the ground. Well, tell me, who, do, where did this prior notice come from? Prior nor I believe that it came from David Jones, who and was David, the, the mailman. The David Jones, the mailman, told you that the ATF was coming in 45 minutes to serve a search warrant. He did not tell me personally. Apparently, he went up to the front, the foyer area, where David was with a group of people and told Koresh. And you were there with Mr. No, Koresh? No, I was in the back. I was in the cafeteria area. You were nowhere around Mr. Koresh at the time he was around no, the front door? No, I was door. not. I was not. Uh, was Mr. Jones a member of the Branch Davidians? Mm-hmm. Well, see, again, I, I always consider myself a student of the Seven Seals. Branch Davidian is something that I really heard on February 28th when the ATF right. raided, so... But Mr. Jones was a member of your group, yes. let me put it that way. Uh, was that known to authorities that Mr. Jones was a member of your group? I would think that it would be. I mean, he's the mailman in the community, and he spends a lot of time out there. He lived out there for some time. He did have a private residence. Do you have any idea where Mr. Jones got his information that the ATF was coming to serve a search warrant? From what I have read and been told, is it was from the, a news media truck that was at the other end of the, the property, down at the end of the, at the end of the Doubly Ranch Road, I believe it to be. A news media truck told Mr. Jones that the ATF was on its way. That's that's well, right. the story that I heard, and you know, I, I it, this really got. David didn't really talk too much about it to me personally, but the story that I got from the news media, and I will say that I take everything I hear from the media with a grain of salt, that there was well, a news media truck down uh, there, and well, I have they, they were asking I him directions. Well, I have another question I want to ask you before my time comes up. You knew Cyrus, 
I'm sorry? Mr. Koresh's son, Cyrus? Yes, I knew Cyrus. I believe was the son of his legitimate l wife, Rachel? Yes, ma'am. Were you there when, at the age of three, Cyrus was forced to sleep on the kitchen floor night after night and without any food until he was too weak to eat? No, I had not heard anything about that, and I really doubt the validity of that story. And would you know anything about Cyrus at that point being taken to a garage in Pomona, I believe, and kept in a garage overnight? There yep. are witnesses who say they took him there. He was told by his father that there were huge rats in this building, and he was made to stay there alone, terrified and scared. Okay, of course, what you're referring to is the film that came out. I called the... I, no, I haven't seen any film well, at there all. was a film. These were testimonies from, from witnesses who, including a man who himself took young Cyrus at the age of three out to spend overnight in a garage I came on. I came onto the scene in 1991. I believe these things, if they happened at all, happened prior to me coming onto the scene. But I have never heard any talk about this occurring. And is when I saw this ATF propaganda film, ma'am, I, I was very is, Mr. T is it your testimony, Mr. Thibodeau, that he did not spank children as young as eight months until their bottoms bled? No, he did not till the bottoms bled. He did spank his children when they were disobedient. But basically, eight months old, the mothers did. I don't know about eight-month-old children being spanked. Mothers have testified to that, as you know. And Carrie, do you know anything about that? Were babies spanked at that compound? Little babies? Yeah. Did you know Cyrus? Yep. Is what I said about Cyrus, is that true, to the I best of your recollection? I don't know. How small were the babies when they were spanked, and did you ever see any of those spankings? Eight months old. And these babies were spanked with what? A wooden paddle. Called? Helper. Helper. And uh, what reason would, would drive Mr. Koresh to spank an eight-month-old child? Uh, Robin Bunz's son countless amounts of times because Wisdom didn't like him. And Wisdom would run away. And he would call him back over and spank him, and then Wisdom would run away again, and he would call him over and spank him again. And then he would tell Robin to go spank him, and Wisdom, he would sit Wisdom on his lap, and Wisdom would be sniffling and crying, and then he'd run away again and get spanked. Have you ever known of any occasion where Mr. Koresh divide, uh, kept a child from having food? You can answer that question, Ms. Slaughter, but your time is up. I, it is. But if you'd answer that for me, do you know how he, if he punished by denying food for more than one day or several days at a time? I don't know about that, no. Thank you very much. Mr. Zeller, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Carrie, thank you for being here. I know it's been a long and difficult uh, day. Uh, I just, on the record, you, you were invited uh, as the uh, Democratic minority witness, and uh, it was you, you asked to uh, be here by subpoena. Is that correct? Yeah. And you needed the subpoena because it was needed so that your father could be with you? Very much, um, Mr. Goldstein. Is it is it possible or on probable cause? Is it, is it possible that that it becomes stale and is it stale if it's six or seven months old? And would a warrant be valid if probable cause was stale? There are very few cases that actually deal with the issue of staleness, uh, but there is a lot of rhetoric, a lot of dicta in cases that suggest that staleness is certainly relevant to probable cause, and it goes to whether or not you would have a reasonable belief that whatever you have that causes you to believe items of evidence will be located at a particular situs will still be there when you attempt to obtain the warrant and execute it. Thank you. Uh, the, the warrant authorized the search of the uh, entire premises of the 77-acre compound. All buildings were included in the scope of the search. This included all personal belongings of some 90 men, women, and children besides the person named in the search warrant. Given the crimes alleged to have occurred, is the warrant so overbroad as to be unconstitutional? There are always those concerns, and I think this is one of the, one of, if there's something healthy that comes out of these hearings, it would be that a, an evaluation of what we expect goes on during motions to suppress in criminal trials is not, in fact, what does. Uh, the truth of the matter is that a warrant should be, it, the, the Fourth Amendment talks about a particular item in a particularized place. One would want particularity. It would keep them, for example, where people were living, for example, in a college dormitory, from searching the entire building because of probable cause to believe one errant student had violated the law. 
On the other hand, I can tell you this from common experience, and I think you could talk to prosecutors and defense lawyers who would agree with me, the idea that we will prevail on motions to suppress because the probable cause is stale or because the warrant is too broad because it allows the search of an entire building where the distinction between rooms and residences is difficult uh, to pinpoint uh, is foolhardy. Quite frankly, that's one of the reasons why none of these good lawyers raised the issue. Uh, it's simply, in practice, we don't have any teeth in terms of being able to enforce these kinds of restrictions that I think, as your question points out, are needed. We need Thank to you. restrict law enforcement in terms of time. We need to restrict them in terms of place. That's Thank not asking too much, and they're able to enforce the laws, I think, adequately with those kinds of restrictions. Thank you, Mr. Goldstein. Mr. Thibodeau, tell us about finding Winston Blake dead. When um, the raid initially occurred and the shooting started, I got down on the ground. I went into the, um, to the dorm area I had mentioned earlier. wish I had a diagram to show you. But I went down the hallway of the dorm to uh, the end. Actually, the first room I went into was the weight room, and I waited there for, I would say, between five and ten minutes. Time is pretty irrelevant when you're being shot at. Then uh, Jimmy Riddle and Oliver Garfish Jr. ran down the hall in front of me. They went to the underground bus area. They opened up the door, and they went down into it, and that's when I followed suit behind them. I got downstairs, and uh, Oliver Garfish Jr., myself, and Jimmy Riddle were down there. Jimmy went down the hallway into the tornado shelter that was being built. He started to walk around in the mud, and the agents could hear him from upstairs, and they were yelling obscenities at him, telling him to come out, screaming at the top of their, yell uh, at the top of their lungs obscenities. Uh, I think that Jimmy wanted to make sure that they weren't going to come in and, and take us out that way. Well, anyway, to make a uh, long story short, after a period of, I would say, 20, 30 minutes, the, uh, we went back upstairs just as the uh, ceasefire was being established. Jimmy Riddle and Oliver Garfish Jr. ran up the hallway. I was crawling still because there was some sporadic fire. I came to the first room that was to my left, and water was pouring out of the bottom of this room. And again, there was no door on there. There was a blanket on there. I opened up the blanket, and I looked in, and it was the area of the building where there's three water tanks on the outside. The middle water tank had been punctured a number of times, as well as the glass. The first thing I focused on was the glass that was shot out. My eyes were still adjusting from being in a dark place. I noticed the water pouring out of the bullet holes onto the floor. I followed one of the streams down, and there was, w there was a body there. I couldn't tell who it was at first. After a period of time, my eyes focused on the body, and I could see that it was a large lump. I made it out to be Winston Blake. I remember he had a red jacket on, and it was Winston, and the water was pouring down onto him, and there was a, there was a pile of blood by his head. He was not moving. I pretty much knew that Winston was dead and was not going to move. I shut the curtain, and I went up the hallway trying to hold my breakfast in that morning. Last question, Mr. Thibodeau. On this, uh, this, this is a hanging, and this, is, this happens to be a uh, paperweight. Um, is this similar to some of the things that you may have seen inside this, this little paperweight here, this hand grenade? Yeah, it looks similar. Is, is it possible that this hand grenade could be a paperweight? Yeah, it is possible. Okay, I say that in the extent that if you put a sign on there that says complaint department pull pin, then, then obviously it's a paperweight. It depends on what is inside the hand grenade so that makes it active that or not. This, this it's also possible it could have been active. Is not a hand grenade or used for the intended purpose of a hand grenade. No, it, it's possible either way, sir. That this, this could be a paperweight that is not dangerous. It's just used to hold papers down? Yes. Mr. Zeloff, your, your time Thank is up. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Thurman. Thank five, you, Mr. Chairman. Minutes. At this time, I would like to uh, yield my time to the distinguished gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Jewell, like some other members of this body, I was a, a bit disturbed by some of the graphic things your daughter had to say. But having said that, I think it is also very fair that you be given an opportunity to tell this body about your experiences in going to court in Michigan to prevent your daughter from being held in custody by David Koresh, the events that, again, why don't you tell this committee some of the things that you know that were going on that the Michigan court agreed with when they decided to, to keep your daughter from ever being in the presence of David Koresh? I wasn't expecting to speak today, so this catches me a bit off guard. 
I don't believe that uh, he's been sworn in, but I'd be very glad to do that, Mr. Taylor. I won't do it on your time. If you'd uh, note mine, if you'd raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Then uh, the record will reflect the answer with affirmative. You may be seated. Mr. Taylor, you still have the four and three quarters minutes or something like Thank that. In the process. Well, Parliamentary inquiry, please state it, Mr. Senator. Will other people be added without notice? Uh, and can other people bring in witnesses? Normally, that would not be the case, but I believe under these circumstances, with the father of uh, the young woman here, it, it, it's appropriate. I understand it's extraordinary. I just like to know the. No, reason. not nor normally we would not. We've got a schedule. We print them. We publish them. It's a good, a good inquiry. But you're Ms. correct, Mr. Chairman. If, yes, if Mr. I may, Taylor. Mr. Jewell, I hate to, to interrupt, but the point I'm trying to make is the same point I made at the beginning of this hearing. I think if you operate in a vacuum leading to the date of February 28th you can jump to the wrong conclusion as to what the role of this nation and those people hired by this nation to enforce this nation's laws have taken place. Do you, who are the most familiar with what happened to your daughter and what you tried to prevent from continuing to happen to your daughter, don't you think that this body needs to know what went on at that compound prior to February 28th? Absolutely, sir. Mr. May I turn it to Mr. Barber, as a local law enforcement agent who turned and asked the ATF to augment the efforts of your agency. Do you feel like the law was being broken on a regular basis at that compound prior to your calling in the ATF to help out your agency? We had a lot of accusations and suspicions, but we did not have probable cause on anything at that time. Then, Mr. Barber, may I ask, why did you contact the ATF? My primary concern was the hand grenades. Okay. Mr. Jewell, if, if I may return to you, would you please inform this committee of some of the things that you brought to the Michigan court's attention when that court ruled that your daughter could no longer be brought into the presence of David Koresh? Honor about the morning of Halloween in, uh, I believe it was 1991. <coughs> and again, I'm speaking somewhat impromptu here, so my dates may be somewhat shuffled, but. I received a call very early in the morning, and it was from Mr. Mark Bro, whose name was raised earlier. He identified himself to me, and he said, Mr. Jewell, I have nothing I can give you that would make you have a reason to believe me, but I hope you will. He said, do you know a Sherry Jewell? Because he wasn't even sure that he had contacted the right person. I said, yes, she's my former wife. And your daughter is Kiri? I said, yes. He said, sir, I... I have reason to believe that your daughter is in danger. And at that point, he had my full attention. And he began to tell me about the fact that he was a former member and that he, in fact, had been placed fairly highly in the hierarchy of David Koresh's organization. And he began to tell me who David Koresh was and what he was and what he was intending to do, not just with my daughter. I learned at that point that David Koresh intended to take my then nine-year-old daughter as his, maybe ten-year-old daughter, as his wife, but that he also had plans to destroy the earth. And I f must say that I feel a little uneasy using that phrase in the chambers of the United States Congress because it seems so preposterous. But if you believe it, it's not preposterous. The David Koresh that I came to know of and who I spoke with twice on the telephone was a man of absolutely unparalleled evil intent. It was his plan to bring about any circumstances necessary that would start a war between he and his followers and the rest of the world. Over a period of years prior to my conversation with David Correct, er, er, with Mark Bro, excuse me, I um, had had information that would come to me slowly and in little bits and pieces from, from my former wife, Sherry Jewell, who died in that fire, and from my daughter about what it was they were studying and what they believed and the things that were going to happen. And I heard about wars that they were going to be involved in that would, would cause literal rivers of blood. And I heard about friends supposedly being told 
that if they didn't come and join the group, that they would be killed. I have sworn affidavits in, in the possession of my attorney that refer to the remarks that Mrs. Slaughter was making earlier about babies being beaten at the age of eight months old until their buttocks bled. And I don't refer to one affidavit, I refer to several. I have testimony about women being held captive for months at a time and being systematically raped and demoralized to the point where they would then consent to the will of David Koresh and or his henchmen. David Koresh perhaps truly believed that he was the incarnation of some deity or some power, but it was not heavenly. Mr. Taylor, your, uh, your time has Mr. expired here. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I have two requests that I think are very pertinent. Number one, since Mr. Jewell's time was very limited, I would request that the testimony involved in the trial in Michigan where he sought custody of his child and to prevent his child from falling into the hands of David Koresh, that be included in this testimony, sent if, for the sake of brevity. If you can make it, uh, provide it, it, it will be done without objection. Secondly, Mr. Chairman, I have an opening statement that I would like to include in the record. Without objection, it's thank so included. Mr. Hyde, you are recognized for five minutes. I thank you, and I'm pleased to yield my five minutes to Mr. Schiff. I thank the chairman of the committee for yielding. I'd like to take a moment, uh, Mr. Chairman, to put in focus a couple of important issues here. First of all, just as the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms investigation and raid never involved Mr. Koresh's personal practices, however outrageous they were, with, with girls the age of Kiri Jewell, they never involved an allegation of child abuse in spanking young infants, which of course would be equally outrageous if in fact it occurred. The alcohol, tobacco, and firearms uh, search warrant and arrest warrant dealt exclusively with firearms violations. And I would ask my colleagues who are listening and, uh, here today to decide if the other information that is constantly dumped into the middle of this hearing is relevant to the issues we must ultimately arrive at here. Second of all, I'd like to focus on the search warrant. Now, I'm not going to ask uh, further academic questions about the search warrant, but I want to make the point that I think its relevancy to this hearing has been missed. In my mind, its relevancy to this hearing is not whether it, it legally established probable cause. I think it's possible that it did. But I think there are other aspects of the search warrant which are, which are more relevant to what we're studying today, which is the activities of federal law enforcement agencies in this situation. And those other aspects were our first, it was put together as a number of witnesses have testified in a prejudicial and inflammatory manner. And second, by the fact that no matter whose copy of the name of the offense is correct, it clearly misstates the U.S. Code statute number for the offense charged, and I think makes other technical mistakes in the law, which means to me it was put together in a sloppy fashion. Now, you put together inflammatory with sloppy, that translates to me that, that ATF was in a hurry to make a big splash with something. And I think that if that's true, and we have seven and a half more days to determine that, I think if that's true, uh, that is substandard performance. And we'll hear from them, and they'll have a chance to explain. Now, with that, I'd like to use the balance of my fi five minutes to ask a few further questions. Uh, De Deputy Barber, during the course of this uh, investigation, I assume you met a number of ATF personnel. That's correct. Did, did you meet any of their public relations people who came to the scene before the raid? Uh, yes, I believe that one, uh, I think her first name was Sharon Wheeler. Right. You know that she's in, pu I believe she's in public relations for her ATF? Yes, I knew that. And you know, and they brought her there before the raid, I believe? I met her the day of the raid. The day of? The day of, yes. Do you know when she arrived? No, I don't. All right. Um, let me turn now to uh, Mr. Uh, McMahon. Mr. McMahon, when you did business with Mr. Koresh in firearms, where did you do business? I sold him some guns from my home. I my license premise was my home. From your, your license premises was your home? Yes, sir. And you didn't live on the Branch Davidian compound? 
No, sir. So he came to your home? S sometimes, and sometimes I go out there and see him. But he'd be willing to come to your home? Sure. Did he come to your home regularly? Uh, I mean, maybe once to every three or four months or so, but... Okay. Um, let me turn to Mr. Thibodeau. Uh, Mr. Thibodeau, um, um, at the time the, the, that the raid first took place, February 28th, the ATF is arriving. Uh, Mr. Koresh knew the ATF, before that, Mr. Koresh knew the ATF was coming, in your opinion? Before. Well, did, did Mr. Koresh know the raid was going to occur before it occurred? I think that when David Jones came in with that information, that yes, he knew. And how long was that before the raid? Um, I'm not really sure. It's been said 45 minutes. All right. And David Jones was a mailman who belonged to the Bran Branch Davidian sect? Yeah, he, he lived there off and on. He, he had a property outside, but he was frequently coming. I mean, his whole family was there. Do you know where he got the information from? As I said uh, previously, it, was, it appeared to be from a, a news truck that was at the end of the, and this is from what I heard in the press, a news truck that was at the end of the, uh, the, the, um, the road, and they were asking directions, is this, are we anywhere near the Branch Davidian compound or the house or whatever? I don't know what they said to him. So, and I, I know you're not directly the witness here, but as far as you know, Mr. Jones was asked for directions to the Branch Davidian compound from a news truck. No, the news truck was asking him. I, I, th I think he pulled over seeing the news truck and said, hey, you know, what's going on? And being a mailman, they automatically assumed, oh, this guy's all right. Well, you know, we're looking for the, maybe you could help us. I, I believe it was that kind of thing. Could all you right. tell us where the Branch Davidian? Do you know who told the news truck that there was something that was going to be newsworthy happening there very soon? I, I don't know for certain. It would sound to me like that would be the ATF. Okay. And since you won't be here for the testimony about the raid, one last question. From the best of your recollection, would you say again, from which direction, uh, front, back, up or down, do you believe the first shots were fired from? I personally believe from the front, but it didn't take long after the front began to the back, so I would think it was pretty close to simultaneously. And may, may I make a statement? Please, if okay. it's brief, because I'm out of Okay. Time. In the past, I've been... We've all been put through the ringer on this whole thing, okay? And time and time again, I've seen things like the Donahue shows and some of these shows, and it's never a fair form. And I kind of feel cheated here today because I have some specific things that I'd like to address. A lot of these points that were made can be addressed in counterpoints, and I've not been allowed to give that testimony, and I don't think anybody else, any of the other survivors have been allowed yet, and I really, truly hope we have that opportunity to, to address some of these are, points are, that have been you, made Are you able today. to return to this hearing at some point, Mr. Tibbs? Yes, I am, absolutely. Well, I'd, I'd let you work that out with if, the chairman, if, uh, then yield if back. If I might, your time is up, Mr. Schiff, and we may be able to give you some of that opportunity here. The panel is uh, going to be recessed uh, because we have a vote. Uh, we are going to take a recess, this joint committee. Mr. Conyers will have his uh, five minutes next. If Mr. Klinger comes back his, uh, perhaps between the two of them, there will be that opportunity. If there's not, uh, then uh, we'll have to, or, or Ms. Collins might come back. If not, why we will have to uh, find another alternative. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. We'll Mr. be here in Chairman. recess till after this vote. You're watching the first day of Waco hearings before the House Joint Oversight and Judiciary Committee. We'll return in a moment, but first, some program information. Our companion network, C-SPAN 2, welcomes over 3,800 new subscribers at TCI Cable in Boyne City, Michigan. TCI joins cable companies all across the country, adding C-SPAN 2 to their systems. Our companion network's public affairs programs and live coverage of the U.S. Senate can now be viewed by 39 million cable television subscribers. Thursday morning, live at 7 Eastern Time, our Washington Journal. The C-SPAN school bus will be at the Pentagon. Guests for our newspaper roundtable, Republican Congresswoman Tilly Fowler and Democratic Representative Ike Skelton. Live Thursday morning, here on C-SPAN. C-SPAN, a public service created by America's cable television companies. Uh, 
We continue now with the Waco investigation, the first day of hearings before a House Joint Subcommittee. Chairing the hearing, Republican Bill Zeliff of New Hampshire and Republican Bill McCollum of Florida. Subcommittee has called to order. We have uh, just a couple of more questions of some witnesses, a couple more questioners who are here. We really have three more. Uh, one uh, chairman and two ranking members, of chairman of the full oversight committee. I was prepared to go to Mr. Conyers, and I will uh, next, but uh, Ms. Collins has agreed, and I think, Mr. Conyers, if you would, Mr. Barber has to run out. I don't know if either of you have questions of Mr. Barber, but he's got to catch a plane. Uh, Mr. Cl I have a question. Mr. Klinger is going to yield to me to ask, and out of uh, comedy to this, uh, if you don't, you don't have any questions, Mr. Barber. No, I no, don't. Nobody does, and I would uh, ask with your, with unanimous consent, then that Mr. Klinger could have uh, some portion, a minute of his time to yield to me, and I'll ask I Mr. Barber. I would be delighted to yield to the chairman. Thank you One very minute. much, Mr. Barber. Uh, I just want to clarify something completely for the record. I asked you some questions, and then some more were followed up at the end uh, here by some other people today about the grenades and about drug labs and all of that. Uh, my understanding is that from your testimony that the reason you primarily turned over, maybe the only reason I think you said you turned over the case or called up ATF was because of these grenades that the UPS folks had, had um, gotten or found or whatever in the mail system. Is that correct? I just want to corroborate that. It was a combination of the grenade bodies and the explosives materials that they were receiving. But the bottom line is those grenade bodies, as I understand it, were bodies. They, you, there was some evidence there were other material there, but the bodies themselves were not live grenades. Is that correct? They were not live grenades uh, the first time I saw them. No, and they were what other material were you concerned about besides the grenades, besides these grenade bodies, we call it? It was the potassium nitrate and the uh, powdered metals. Now, where had you been aware of those from? What was your source for that information? Graduating from the uh, bomb technician school at Redstone. But no, 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 no. I mean, how did you know they were getting that stuff? Uh, that was also uh, obtained from UPS. That material was obtained from UPS? The documentation was. But you didn't have any of the, uh, you had some of the grenade uh, bodies, but you didn't have any of the no, chemicals. No, sir, I did not have any of those. Yeah, you are just listening to UPS fellows talk about delivering stuff out there. And I would actually get a copy of the receipt. Okay. Last uh, question, and again, just to clarify it, you told me earlier that several years before the raid, there was some evidence of a methamphetamine lab, but there was nothing current at the, that time. There was no current evidence within the last year or so, to your knowledge, of any other drug activity, uh, production of drugs, or any of that sort of thing on the compound problem, was there, or proper, was there? No, sir, not to my knowledge. All right. I don't have any other questions in Mr. Barber, and if uh, I'm going to uh, yield back to Mr. Klinger to reserve the balance of his time, which I think is uh, three and a half minutes at this point. And um, I would yield then to Mr. Conyers is ready for his five minutes to, uh, to Mr. Conyers. Mr. Barber, you're excused. Hope you can catch your plane. Thank you very much for coming uh, and being with us. Mr. Conyers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, compliment you as I have about the fairness in which you conducted the hearing and Mr. Zimmer as well. And I'm hoping that uh, we can resolve the uh, outstanding question of the subpoenas uh, this evening after we've concluded our activity. Um, let me just ask Mr. Thibodeau uh, a yes or no answer as to whether uh, the NRA or anyone on its behalf has, connect, has contacted you in connection with this hearing? No. In any way? Not in arena. All right. Uh, Mr. Mac Mahone, may I ask you that same question, please? Yes, sir. Those were the only people that wished to uh, hear the truth. You say, yes, you have been contacted? I was contacted, like, uh, right after the uh, raid and fire. This was a while back. No, I meant in connection with the hearing that we're having today. Oh. Um, yes, sir, I have been contacted. Sure. And... Uh, can you give us a little idea of uh, when you were contacted?
Uh, well, I mean, was it uh, yesterday? Um, have I talked to them yesterday? Yes. I did talk to them yesterday. Sure. I talked to them uh, And was it the day ago, before? Too. The day before. Yes, the no, day before I, yesterday. No, sir. I was. I didn't get the letter to come here till yesterday. I see. And uh, what was the the nature of the discussion between you and them? Um, just what will I be doing there? What's going on? I mean, I've, I well, I didn't testify in front of a trial this. or anything. It's the first time I've been in front of anybody. I understand. And I want to know what's going on. Let me ask you this: uh, Who was it that you talked to there? Um, I talked to Jim Warner, Mr. Warner. I thought about the name of Mr. Warner. Right. Right. The Deputy General Counsel. Of I, I believe you. I don't he know. sounded like a lawyer. <laughs> okay. Let's let's move on. We'll we'll get more. I'd like to ask you to amplify that, uh, but we don't have time in the period of five minutes. What what uh, I need to bring to this part of our hearing is that uh, just recently in the uh, GOP contract with America, and specifically H.R. 666, we voted out a bill with nearly unanimous Republican support that didn't require that uh, we have uh, exceptions to the exclusionary rule, good faith exceptions. We said that we went a lot further than that. They did, not me. And said that uh, we would throw the whole warrant requirement out of the window if this part of the contract on America becomes law because we would have an expedited uh, exemption to the whole exclusionary rule. We pointed out that this was eroding the whole Constitution. And now I am so pleased to find that the same people that voted to further erode the, cons the exclusionary ro rule of which Mr. Goldstein has very uh, adequately complained of are now very worried that uh, there, there aren't teeth in it, there, there wasn't enough, it was very shoddy, and now we have this uh, incredible conflict. Uh, the bill that, the, the crime bill we passed out says warrants aren't even needed for searches. It says there's no need for a magistrate to determine whether there's probable cause. It gives total discretion of prob probable cause to the law enforcement authorities. As long as they believed that there was probable cause, then no warrant would be required at all. That's the law coming down the pike. Now, Mr. Deschamps, before drawing up his affidavit, David, Agent Aguilar had spoken with several former compound residents who told him there were machine guns at the compound. He also spoke with firearm dealers who told him they delivered kits that could be converted, uh, uh, convert semi-automatic guns into automatic weapons. He spoke with a UPS employee who saw a hand grenade fall out of a package before being delivered to the compound. He spoke with Lieutenant Barber, who told him that a rancher living near the compound had heard machine gun fire. After the raid, machine guns and hand grenades were found. Is there any case law anywhere that would say that such a factual predicate could, in, in, under any circumstances, be insufficient for probable cause in order to obtain a warrant? I'm certainly not aware of any such case law. Mr. Cunningham has gone. Well, I want to thank uh, all of the witnesses, and I'm hopeful that uh, Mr. Jewell, who had not completed his testimony uh, with Mr. Taylor, would be given an opportunity uh, to do so, because uh, I wanted to hopefully ask him, Mr. Chairman, uh, who I praise for such eminent fairness, that did Mr. Koresh personally tell you that if the authorities ever came after him, he'd shoot them? Well, it may be that we can let uh, Mr. Jewell answer a question like that after we're done, if Mr. Thibodeau is also given a couple of minutes who wants to say something, too. So, but let's see what happens in our time. We've got a whole other no, You don't, you don't think that's a very important question? Well, I think it's an important question. I think well, maybe Mr. Thibodeau wants to say it's important, too, but we've got to be judicious. Mr. Klinger has three and a half minutes left. 
uh, and I yield to him. I thank the chairman for yielding, and I um, apologize for not having been here to listen to the testimony. And I just have one question, and I'm going to yield the balance of my time to uh, the vice chairman of the committee who has been here for the entire testimony, Mr. Schiff. But my question would be to Mr. McMahon, and I think you indicated sir, that you had been and uh, had had conversations with the representative of the NRA. I have. And and uh, I, my, my question is simply this: Was there an attempt made to influence or? Uh, uh, direct your testimony? Were you uh, in any way uh, influenced in the way you were supposed to testify here today? Uh, no, sir, they did not. I, I, I thank you very much. And at this point, I would like to yield the balance of my time to uh, Mr. Schiff. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Mr. Thibodeau, you indicated that there were several points that you thought could be and should be refuted. Uh, on what subject? About well, what? Okay, the, sub the first subject that I think needs to be brought out is the fact that in 1992, um, not the federal government, but the state authorities came and investigated the children, and they went through the signs of the physical, the mental, and the sexual abuse, and they couldn't find any, and they dropped their case. A state, didn't a state official actually come out to the compound? Yes, that is correct. The was federal, the, was the, the state official uh, fired on by anyone? Absolutely not. Uh, was the state official they came out with a sheriff's in prison department. so that uh, uh, he or she, I believe she in this case, couldn't leave? No. She was free to come and go. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. And as a matter of fact, when asked about the underground bus, David Koresh took her down there and showed it to her. So, I mean, from what my understanding was, he pretty much opened the place up to her. But anyway, they found no signs of the, the abuse that's been discussed, and um, they dropped their case. The next day in the Waco Tribune Herald, um, the health people said that these were the nicest, most well-behaved children we've ever had the pleasure to work with. And, you know, I think if we're going to check out the child abuse issue, that's a pretty powerful statement for a health worker to make for kids that are, that are abused readily, as we have heard. Well, and also I, the Sheriff's I, I Department. I just want to say that the child abuse issue, in my judgment, has absolutely nothing to do with this hearing. I agree with you Because it was 100%. not a matter that was being investigated by federal law enforcement. doesn't mean it's not an important issue. But since uh, it's been brought up time and time again, mm -hmm. I thank you at least for putting it in the other side. Go, go ahead, please. Well, yeah, one more thing. The Sheriff's Department also came out with them. And the next day in the press, David spent a lot of time talking with the people from the Sheriff's Department because of what happened in 1987 with George Roden. He felt he was misfairly treated. But he spent a long time talking to him, invited them out later on to go fishing or whatnot. I mean, who invited? Who? I'm sorry. He ahead. invited the Sheriff's Department. Some of these Sheriff's Department officials, I do not know the names. But who invited the Sheriff's Department? Crush did okay. himself when they came out with the health workers. And they said the next day in the Waco Tribune Herald that the only problem with people out there at Mount Carmel is that they're misunderstood. You know, I mean, these are quotes from the, from the legal representation of McLennan County, and I think it's pretty much well documented that David Koresh knew Jack Harwell, the sheriff, on a first name basis. Mm -hmm. And I think that they, the ATF definitely should have gone through Jack and come out uh, with the sheriff to, to, to knock on the door and not, by the way, the search warrant, if I just may say this really quick, that was a knock search warrant. You're supposed to go to the door, knock on the door, and present it. I don't understand how you can serve a knock search warrant with helicopters coming into the back, three different groups of ATF agents, one going up the side to throw in flashbang grenades to get the evidence, while another team goes and, 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 and shoots the dogs, while yet another team is going to the front door to serve the warrant. That's, that's spontaneous. It's happening at once. And that is not, and you can get a no-knock search warrant, sir, if, if my understanding is correct. They did not have one, and I don't understand why they would choose a dynamic entry with having a knock search warrant. Well, let me go back to the Sheriff's Department. Are you saying the Sheriff's officials were invited out to the compound? Yes. You actually saw them there? No, they never came out later, but came. David always made the invitation open to them to come out if they wanted to fish on our pond because we had a stocked bass pond. All right, so and he they, wasn't hesitant by ha about having law enforcement agents there. No, and you know, there was one more in interesting incident I just thought of. When, when the initial reports came in about all these uh, automatic weapons, mm -hmm. Steve Schneider actually went into the Sheriff's Department and put a, hel a Hellfire trigger switch uh, on, the, on the desk and said, this is legal, I believe, under the ATF. That's probably what you heard out there. Now, you know, I, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, sir. All I'm saying is that all the way along, Koresh tried to work with law enforcement. And I know this from experience. Koresh well, always tried to work with people. Schiff, your, your time has expired. Uh, I, I, I thank the Chair. Uh, At this you. time, uh, I will yield five minutes to Ms. Collins. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before the clock starts running, I need to uh, ask for some verification, and I'll tell you what it is. I have a split-second yes or no answer that I'd like, and I'd like to yield another 15 seconds to Mr. Conyers, and then two uh, minutes to Mr. Uh, uh, Gene Green, and two minutes to uh, Sheila Jackson Lee. Uh, I don't have a time watch here, and, and you're going to take the time. We'll take care of it. We'll do our best. Uh, 
I just wanted to make sure because I know those lights go off real fast. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll do our best. Maybe we'll do this by hand. <laughs> we'll do our own stopwatch over here. You get going now. I'll yield to you now. Your time, your clock starts running right now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I yield to uh, Mr. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. McMahon, would you give us uh, by tonight uh, some statement about your contact with the NRA that we were discussing, please? Yes or no? Uh, no, I, I'm, no I, that wasn't a question. I was asking him to do that. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know, understand why. Are you saying? Are you ordering me to? Are you saying do it? Or are you saying? Yes, not I would it? like you to do it, please. <laughs> I'll consider. I think okay. The time, I think the time. I think the time is right. that she's yielded to you. Let, she wants to yield. Let, more let me quickly ask Mr. Thibodeau on Turning Point last Thursday night on ABC. Uh, you testified that you saw Koresh when the, the the raid occurred. You saw Mr. Koresh hold out his hand and said, "Let's talk about this." Okay. Do, do you remember that testimony? Yes, I do remember that testimony. And today you said you were nowhere near the door with him, that you were way at the back of the room. Because what I said with that testimony, sir, Mr. Conyers, what I said with that testimony is I said that I, that I heard from three separate eyewitnesses who were at the front door that told me the same thing, that that oh, is exactly what occurred. You didn't see No, I made, I made that clear that I was not at the front okay. door, but that right, eyewitness testimony Wait, told me. Uh, Mr. Jewell, um, can you tell me uh, from, from, from your own knowledge, what perhaps Mr. Koresh told you he would do if authorities ever came after him. I will try to uh, make this as short an answer as I possibly can, but over a period of years in trying to maintain contact with my daughter, I have called the compound and twice got Mr. Koresh on the phone and uh, was engaged in a conversation with him. Mr. Koresh and I shared a common religious ancestry in that we were both raised Seventh-day Adventists. We had that in common. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we understood that in the time of the end that God's people would be persecuted and perhaps put to death. He told me during the course of that conversation that that was true. However, when they came after him and his people, they were going to fight back and kill anybody that they had to. Thank you very much. I yield uh, to Mr. Green, Gene Green. Appreciate Mr. Schiller. Ranking member of my committee yielding time to Mr. Schiller. Let me, I don't know if we still have the grenade paperweight that, that was shown earlier, and, and maybe it's just because I'm from Texas and I've seen them before in, in you know, uh, Army surplus stores, and, and uh, but I don't have a, a case of them. <laughs> and, uh, and Mr. Mahon, if you could tell me, the we heard testimony from Mr. Barber about your UPS saying that there were cases of those uh, paperweights that were delivered, and that was one of the reasons for the, uh, his concern in calling in ATF. Um, in your experience as a firearms dealer, do you know of that, at that location if they were using those uh, hollow grenades to pack explosives in? I, I never seen any hollow grenades. I never seen them out there. I have okay. seen those type of grenades at gun shows as a paperweight, but I have never seen any at Davis. Okay, so you didn't saw none of them. Do you know of any of them that have ever been used to uh, pack explosives in and then use them as a grenade? By the Branch Davidians? No. no by do you know if that's available? Is that, a, that possible? I, 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 I guess it's possible. I, I mean, I'm not qualified to answer that. I reclaim okay. my time. I yield remaining time to Sheila Jackson Lee. Thank you very much, and I imagine I have to talk like the uh, speeding bullet. I hate to use that terminology. Let me say how proud I am of Carrie. I have a 15-year-old, and I'm just, you've, you've stood here so long. Mr. Jewell, if you can help me, um, you said very clearly you're not a theologian, you're not uh, a pastor, but we talk about uh, this is for the American people, and people hear the word religion, and they hear the fact that we should in this country respect it. Help me understand from what your daughter went through, would you say that he had gone beyond and that we had reached now a point uh, of a cult? Uh, what is your sense of it? And I have a quick question for Mr. McMahon, and you see how fast I'm going. The one thing that I think God expects of us is that we use our own minds to develop ourselves and become everything that we can be. 
that differs from what it is my understanding that David Koresh encouraged his followers to do in that he encouraged them to listen only to him and he could change his mind anytime he wanted to and his word was still law. I think for the American people that's important because you've mentioned a certain religion and I would not want it to be indicted for what really was a true cult and took away the minds of people. Mr. Thank McMahon, you. did you visit Mr. Koresh in the compound? Uh, at Davis House? Yes, ma'am, I did. And, that, and you just mentioned, was that his home? Yes, ma'am. Were there women and children there? Yes, ma'am. Were there some children under five? Uh, I would think so. Karen spent most of the time with the was kids. Was he a licensed gun dealer? Uh, no, ma'am. Not uh, that I know of. Would you of. say that, um, could you describe maybe the amount of weapons that were in the home there, or maybe as much as you sold him? Um, I just turned a list into... Uh, just give me a Just give me a uh, list. I sold him, two, I sold him uh, around 223 guns. Pardon me? I sold him around 223 guns. Uh, would that be the average amount of weapons you find in a normal American family's home? Would you have any uh, way of estimating that? Uh, um, no way of estimating I mean, they have estimated it to be uh, uh, like three guns per person, and that is below the average. And if you're, yeah, this, that this is however, the is a home, children, uh, wives, and you said 223 that you sold, and of course that doesn't account for what else he might have had. Let me um, move, the, and thank you well, very I, much for that, but that yes, was his home. I think I've, I've been very liberal about it. Have about you the been time. liberal, and I've got so many more questions. Well, Chair, I, I Mr. know, Mr. Chairman, but I, yes, let me Collins. thank you for being so liberal with your time. You have certainly been very fair and have extended time, and I greatly appreciate it. Well, you're, you're quite welcome, and it's been a pleasure today. I think I pretty I well... well, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I hope that uh, our earlier question about uh, being able to ask questions will be considered. Thank you. Well, we're doing our best here. Uh, I think that we have pretty well completed all of the formal questions we're supposed to have. If we let this continue, we'll never get to another panel. And as I have questions, I'd like to ask, actually, but uh, nonetheless, I, I think they can be submitted in writing, and, and any of you who want to submit them, please do. And somebody asked earlier about statements before I release this panel and turn the gavel over to Mr. Zeloff. I want to make sure everybody understands, without objection, anybody's statement, any of the witnesses and any of the panel member's statements may be submitted for the record. Mr. Thibodeau, you had wanted to make a statement on the record. Yeah. Uh, we don't have time. No one's got a may question. May I submit them in writing? You may submit it in writing. Absolutely. Thank you, you may very submit much. it in writing. And we've done the best through Mr. Schiff we could to give you some verbal time. With that in, with that in mind, uh, Ms. Thurman. And of course, that would be offered to all of the witnesses, all the witnesses here today. We, that I just we made that statement. All of the witnesses have a right to submit a statement in writing. If How they long desire. Will you hold the record open for? Uh, well, the record's certainly going to be open through the period, at least to the time of the hearings, which are over a period of the next uh, couple of weeks. So right. Certainly through the end of, uh, of this month, I would suggest they'll be open. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, you. Mr. Micah. Just a, a question, a parliamentary inquiry. Uh, I have a copy of uh, Ms. Jewell's uh, uh, notes or statements. I wasn't in when she testified, and I wondered if, uh, if this statement had been made a part of the uh, record. And also, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, when this was uh, uh, presented. It well, the, the, if I might uh, say, if you were not here, the record will reflect that Ms. Thurman was asking the question. She asked Ms. Jewell to read the entire statement, and she read it verbatim. So it has been read into the record, and, Mr. Biden. But when was it given to the uh, committee? Uh, um, I believe the committee received it this morning or this, the, er, this afternoon. At the time she was speaking. Well, it was before that she spoke, but during the, this morning. Because this morning. I, I didn't see that our side had this. This, this morning, we, uh, I know they were at the, at the desks here this morning. Well, for those uh, parliamentary you. inquiries, I, I want to thank this particular panel. You've been very gracious. You've spent your time. Some of you have had some pretty tough questions to answer. But we thank you very much for coming. And now I'm going to turn the gavel back over to my co-chairman, Mr. Zeloff, and for the last panel of the day. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to thank this panel and have the next panel come forward to be seated and sworn in. Proceeding to the witness table. Can we, can we kind of keep it, you guys keep it down a little bit? I'd like to, uh, the order you call from the left, from your left, just tell me. Okay. In the order that I call everybody and introduce you, it'd be on your right, my left. I'll start out with Davey Aquilera, 
Is it pure? David? On my, on your far right, my left, he is a Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Special Agent. Chuck Sarabin is the former Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Special Agent in charge in Houston. Earl Dunnigan is the former Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Special Agent in charge in Houston. Bill Johnson is the Assistant U.S. Attorney in Waco, Texas. Dan Hartnett is the former Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Deputy Director for Enforcement. Ed Owen is a firearms expert for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. H. Jeffrey Moulton, Jr. was the Project Director of the Treasury Department Review Team. Dr. Bruce Perry is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Baylor Medical College. Thank you, gentlemen. You raise your right hand. Do you swear, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to these subcommittees is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. Let the record show that the answer was in the affirmative. Okay. I know that uh, each of you come with a. Uh, Check. Each of you comes with a very special story. We appreciate your, your being here. Uh, some of you appear on future panels during these hearings to address different concerns. Today, by previous agreement, we will try to focus on the investigation and the warrants portion, and we'll begin with questions. The chair now recognizes the vice chair of our National Security Subcommittee and my friend Robert Ehrlich of Maryland for the... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Okay. And thank you all for appearing before us today. Uh, before I begin my formal remarks, I would just like to make okay. a couple uh, points. Bob? Yes. Uh, I, we have changed, we changed the order, and I apologize. Uh, could, would you be willing to hold off? Sure. Um, what I'd like to do is have uh, our colleague, Mr. Barr, 15 minutes first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Johnson, is it Johnson or Johnston? It's actually Johnston with a T. That's, that's what I thought. Uh, you have a law degree? Yes, sir. Uh, and you serve as a uni assistant United States attorney, a prosecutor? Yes, sir, I do. Okay. Uh, I have a law degree and I served as a U.S. attorney, so we have two things in common. I suspect we have something else in common, and that is uh, neither of us are, are particularly enamored of Mr. David Koresh. Am I correct in that we share that in common? Based on what I know, he did some bad things. Uh, based, based on what I know, he did also. And uh, I think that, uh, that uh, is something that we do have in common. Let me, if I could, Mr. Johnston, uh, ask you a few questions. Uh, define uh, very succinctly for me dynamic entry. Uh, I hadn't heard that term of dynamic entry. Uh, until Neither had I. I. I suppose it means uh, some active movement in a search warrant. Well, let me, let me kind of back up then. Uh, do you know what the, the term dynamic entry means? Uh, I could give you a definition that I think it means. Okay. Shall I? Please. Uh, a, a search warrant or a... Uh, could you pull the mic up? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, police activity uh, in connection with a search warrant that involves... Uh, uh, an entry uh, where their persons are not invited in, in other words, as opposed to like where police call ahead of time and uh, are invited in or do some low, uh, low profile uh, entry, it would be more in the nature of a moving search warrant like you might see on television where agents are uh, running instead of walking and so forth. Was, was the, the entry in this case a dynamic entry? I wasn't there, but based on uh, what I've seen on television, in keeping with the definition I've just given, I think it was. Okay. <clears throat> were you, you were not at the scene? No, sir. Okay. Uh, and did you have any discussions uh, at any time prior to the dynamic entry or whatever it, it was on February 28th of, last, of 90, 1993 uh, with ATF concerning a dynamic entry? Uh, not concerning that term. Uh, they discussed... Uh, 
They mentioned almost in passing that they were going to do something I learned in the nature of having agents in cattle trailers. I didn't know the details of the, of the raid plan. Okay. Are you familiar with uh, testimony in a previous court case concerning uh, efforts by a defense attorney to question, uh, raise questions with a witness as to whether or not you had in told them that uh, your office or you would not uh, approve a, a, a search warrant or an affidavit in support of a search warrant unless it contemplated a dynamic entry? I have, and it's a gross mischaracterization of anything okay. I said. Be, be familiar with, with that. Yes, sir. I heard it during the trial. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, would it be fair to say, uh, Mr. Johnston, that the purpose of an investigation in support of a potential prosecution involves uh, an effort to see that justice is done? Absolutely. Uh, would you share with me a concern that federal employees, whether they're involved in law enforcement or non-law enforcement activities, if they violate the law or engage in wrongdoing, that they should be prosecuted and brought to justice? Absolutely. And would you also agree with me that an effort to do so through an internal, that is, within the government investigation, ought to be a search for the truth? I think any investigation ought to be a search for the truth, or it's not much of an investigation. Certainly one involving allegations of wrongdoing on the part of officials sworn to uphold the law. Yes, sir. Okay. With that in mind, then, I would ask you, uh, would it be appropriate in a investigation of alleged wrongdoing by federal officials that the government deliberately and explicitly direct that evidence not be gathered, that, ev that witnesses not be interviewed, that no record of interviews be kept, that the passage of time hopefully will cause witnesses' memories to dim would that be a fair search for the truth, or would that be more in the nature of damage control or a cover-up? Well, what you're describing doesn't sound like, uh, and I, I don't know if you're asking that in hypothetical with reference to this case, sir. It's, it's, it's not hypothetical, and I'm going to show you some documents that establish it's not hypothetical. Uh, if I could have a clerk. Uh, if you would, please, uh, Mr. Johnson. These are three documents which were contained in the documents made available to this body uh, by virtue of the subpoenas. One is a memo from a Robert McNamara to John Simpson and others, Treasury Department, dated 14 April 1993, subject preliminary investigative plan. It says that this is law enforcement sensitive and it involves an investigation of ATF. And it states on page two, quote, DOJ does not want Treasury to conduct any interviews or have discussions with any of the participants who may be potential witnesses. Then later in that same subparagraph, it talks about while we may be able to wait for some of them, witnesses, to have testified in the criminal trial, the passage of time will dim memories. <clears throat> then later on, it states at the very bottom of page two, the prosecutors are concerned that anything negative, even preliminary, could be grist for the defense mill. And that document goes on. Another of the documents that you have before you is a, another Treasury Department document, this one from Ron Noble, Assistant Secretary for Enforcement, dated September 17, 1993. And it reflects an interview that took place on March 1, 1993. And I quote, ATF initiates a shooting review. And then it goes on. Troy tells Review they immediately determined that these stories did not add up. That is, interviews with Rodriguez, Mastin, Panaki, Kavanaugh, Sarabin. Then it says, Johnston at this point advised Hartnett to stop the ATF shooting review because ATF was creating Brady material because Panaki 
had not yet been interviewed, Johnson authorized that interview, but no notes were created. A third document which you have before you is another Department of Justice document dated April 9, 1993, again from Robert McNamara to Ron Noble. While the subject matter at the beginning of that document has to do with Waco press release, in the middle of it, it says, Justice prosecutors in Washington and in Waco said that any words which, would, which could be interpreted as being critical of ATF must be avoided since it would play into the defense attorney's hands and aid the defense attorneys in making ATF the issue. And then that document goes on. There are some other documents that I have before me, uh, and I'll make these available. These are not as clear as these typewritten documents. They are notes that, again, were furnished to us pursuant to subpoena. And if I could have a clerk deliver those to Mr. Johnston, please. One reads as follows, and this is document number 00014137. It says, T. Rangers, perhaps for Texas Rangers, Ray Yon does not want them, Kolnacki, Phil, Ray interviewed because John does not want any more exculpatory statements generated. <clears throat> the other one I think uh, that we've already dealt with in previous testimony had to do with Mr. Yon advising Ron Noble not to open an envelope. And the final one here involves, again, and I apologize uh, for the lack of clarity, but we have to deal with what we have. It again involves some handwritten notes. Uh, the first word at the top of the page looks like Leroy, and it says, statements from agents, A-G-T-S, I presume that means agents, should they go to USA, which I presume is United States Attorney, or us, do they want us to create new, and then there's a blank, and then it concludes by saying, asking questions to which would require us to create new documents. Parenthetically, it says exculpatory. These documents, uh, to me, Mr. Johnston, raise very troubling questions about what was going on here. We heard at the very beginning today an article here in the paper talking about damage control, and this is dated today, July 19th. And I have some very serious concerns here that this started a long time ago. I'm, I'm, and I have a background as a prosecutor, and, and, and I would presume that the, these sorts of, of memos, and I know you didn't generate them, at least I, I don't, it doesn't appear that you did. Uh, they came from another lawyer at the Department of Justice, Mr. McNamara, I believe, and I don't know who wrote the handwritten notes, but these are documents that were furnished by the government, presumably generated by the government as part of an investigation to determine, I suppose, among other things, what went wrong and what agents might have done wrong. I mean, we know that there were things done wrong. I mean, agents were terminated because of that, because of misstatements, because of misleading uh, activities. Uh, was this, I mean, what, what's going on here? Okay. I cannot speak to uh, the references uh, to Ray and Leroy Yon, they were here, and it appears there are references to them in exculpatory matters. Uh, I, I was not concerned about exculpatory <coughs> matters. The truth is the truth. I can speak to the note that has my name in it, which talks about Harden and the shooting review. The uh, typical protocol with ATF, my understanding is, is after an incident, a shooting incident occurs, a shooting review team is created, sometimes out of Washington, sometimes elsewhere. They normally go down and interview the agents. They, I don't know if it's normally recorded or not, but at least notes are taken. Uh, that process started. Uh, there were at least a couple of, uh, there were some interviews, I don't know how many. This was in uh, 
early March, uh, I believe. It was fairly soon after the incident. ATF began, well, immediately received a great deal of criticism uh, for what they had done, and uh, it became obvious, at least to me, that ATF probably should not investigate ATF as far as the criminal case goes. And uh, I don't have the authority to direct ATF to do something, but I did talk to, I think, Mr. Hartnett. I'm not sure. He can state whether or not. And told him that in line with our hope, or at that point maybe a fact, that the Texas Rangers have agreed to investigate this case, let them investigate it, please. Because for ATF to interrogate ATF with the built-in bias and suspicion that already existed, I thought was would be uh, not healthy. Uh, I had no reason to think ATF would, in their own interviews, cover something up, but there were a lot of people that did. And the Texas Rangers, I believe, would be an objective, a qualified body to investigate it. And yes, sir, I asked the Rangers to do the investigation all in all. Now, for a ATF to have come in and had a shooting review team member interview someone and have the Ranger come in three minutes behind and do the same thing I thought was uh, very imprudent. Uh, the Rangers, I believe, could ask questions, get straight answers, and develop uh, the truth of what happened. And it, may I add, in terms of the timing of it, there's some, uh, I feel you've uh, alleged on someone's part, maybe mine, that I want people's memories to dim. In fact, I asked the Rangers to, and I asked the Waco Police Department the night this happened to begin interviewing ATF agents before their memories are dim. Waco Police Detectives, I could name two or three, at my request, went to the Hosp Hillcrest Hospital in Waco and taped interviews with agents while they were still on uh, codeine and so forth. And the Rangers, I asked to, as quickly as they could, get interviewing, and they did, sir, uh, and they were all audio taped on all made available. And there were some exculpatory... Well, the, the, re the reference to sorry. memories being dimmed was uh, contained in this memo by uh, Mr. McNamara. Uh, uh, and it would be I don't very guess interesting I've met Mr. McNamara. I'm sorry. ask him some of these questions. But in terms of your prosecutorial background, uh, which from everything I can tell is, is exemplary, uh, why, why, would, why would the federal government, uh, first of all, be committing things like this to writing, but uh, more importantly, uh, why would they be deliberately uh, directing that in terms of an internal investigation to uncover ro potential wrongdoing, why would they be explicitly directing that evidence not be accumulated, that interviews not be conducted, that when they are, perhaps they are, there ought not to be any notes taken? Uh, I mean, why would that happen? And let me also say, I know as a prosecutor, Brady material can sometimes be a pain in the neck to deal with. Uh, that, that's what happens. Those are the rules. Uh, in, in corporate, we have mechanisms for yes. it, but. Uh, <laughs> It seems to me that the government was trying to cover something up here. Well, well, I sure wasn't. In fact, I was trying to avoid the question of a cover-up. If ATF had done this investigation themselves, as I say, I have no reason to think they would have coached their own agents or would have uh, suggested answers to their agents. But I thought it would have been a real easy thing uh, to criticize and quite objectively, because ATF was under attack so strongly, they may have bonded together in interviews. I don't know. I don't think they would have done it intentionally. But it was extremely important to have objectivity. My desire for the Rangers to do it was to seek the truth in the most unintimidating circumstance possible. In other words, so that the Rangers could ask ATF agents one-on-one, -on -one, which they did, audio taped, everything that happened. And I felt the Rangers, the ATF agents would be comfortable talking to the Rangers, whereas they may not be comfortable talking to ATF supervisors and as Treasury Review, I mean, uh, a, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll try to quickly finish the answer, sir, Mr. Chairman. Because there was conflict within ATF by this time, a lot of agents at the staging area felt they, element of surprise had been lost, there was a lot of conflict. The shooting review teams are often comprised of people involved in supervisory capacities. There was conflict between line agents and supervisors, and I felt to give it the best chance of being a truthful interview of each agent, the Rangers should do it, sir. And as to Brady, I'm not afraid of Brady. As to exculpatory matters, I'm not afraid of exculpatory matters and was not. Well, uh, that, that 
your your sentiments do not seem reflected at all in the in these documents. I certainly I didn't create these, them, sir. These, these certainly will be looked into further. I, I thank the chairman and I thank Mr. Johnson. Thank you. I think uh, I think what we're going to. Anybody know how long this vote's going to be? How many votes? 15 One 15 minute vote. Okay, we're going to recess for 15 minutes. Uh, we have a vote, and we'll be right back. Thank you. We'll continue with the Waco investigation in a moment. But first, some program information. Information about C-SPAN and public affairs is available on your personal computer through America Online. Get our daily program schedule, read the text of pending bills in Congress, and learn about C-SPAN in the classroom. To find out more about America Online, call 1-800-827-6364, extension 8665. If you're already an AOL subscriber, find the C-SPAN area by typing the keyword C-SPAN. Sunday night, the latest developments on The Road to the White House. Our weekly look ahead to the 96th presidential election brings you candidate forums, speeches, and campaign events. Road to the White House, Sunday at 7 and 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time on C-SPAN, the political network of record. We now continue with the Waco investigation, the first day of hearings before a House Joint Subcommittee. Chairing the hearing, Republican Bill Zeliff of New Hampshire and Republican Bill McCollum of Florida. Committees will come to order. The chair recognizes Mr. Schumer from New York for 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all the witnesses for being here. Uh, I have a whole series of questions, but I would like to make one point first. I'm sorry most of my colleagues on the other side aren't here. We've heard a lot of talk about faulty warrants, search warrants, and you know that it might, the, uh, some I might not have been dotted, some T might not have been crossed. If I'm not mistaken, these are the same folks my colleagues to the right here, who voted to eliminate the need for search warrants with the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule. Now, I think that's, you know, I, I didn't support that. I can see an argument, but it does strike me as a little, little strange that just a few months ago, people voted that there should be good faith. No one doubts the good faith of the people here, and yet here we're making huge fuss about warrants not being perfect. Uh, it's the topsy-turvy nature of this hearing altogether. I, my, it's my belief that, uh, as I said in my opening statement, that this idea of moral equivalence, that, well, here we have Koresh, and here we have ATF and FBI, and they're sort of the same. They've each made some mistakes. Maybe ATF is the villain, or FBI is the villain, and Koresh is a misunderstood guy, is going to lead the other side into trouble throughout these hearings, if that's their view, and it seems to me that is in many ways. Now I'd like to ask first Mr. Aguilera some questions. I want to focus on the warrant. First of all, Mr. Aguilera, how many warrants have you put together uh, in your career as a uh, ATF uh, investigator? Approximate. Approximately 30 or more. 30. Have any ever been thrown out? No, sir. So you've had a 100% record in putting together decent warrants. Yes, sir. Warrants at least that met the uh, tests that courts impose. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, and let me ask you this. Uh, what made you initiate the investigation of the possible manufacture of machine guns and explosives uh, devices by Koresh and other members of the Davidians in the compound in Waco? And from whom did you receive the information? I what got you into this is the vernacular question. I received the information from Lieutenant Gene, Gene Barber from the McLennan right. County this Sheriff's This didn't come Department. out of your head or some higher up in Washington or anything like that. This came from local law enforcement. Yes, sir. That's and correct. And they don't call you very often to do something like this, do they? No, sir. This was because of the extreme nature of uh, what Mr. Koresh was doing. That's correct. Okay. In your experiences, 
do people generally order uh, cases and cases of grenade casings and then order uh, the metal parts and the, uh, what's it called, nitrate? Alu no, it makes aluminum nitrate. I guess hydrogen nitrate or ammonium potassium nitrate. nitrate. Hmm? Potassium, nitrate. potassium nitrate. Potassium nitrate, thank you. Uh, do they do that? I mean, do they do that unless usually they have some kind of bad purpose in mind? How many? T no, sir, not no. usually. You don't need, just to clarify for the record, you don't need ammonium nitrate, uh, magnesium, or aluminum powder to help a paperweight? No, sir. No. The uh, casing alone might suffice for the paperweight. I thought so. Um, let me, uh, even Mr. Zeliff is smiling at that question. Um, Mr. Barr is not here. I wanted him to hear it, too. Uh, but in any case, okay, let me, uh, I'm on a roll. Right, well, it's not hard to be on a roll when the facts are on your side. Uh, in any case, let me, um, uh, ask you, other than arms dealers, we saw one of the arms dealers, who else did you interview in an, eff in an effort to find out if the Davidians possessed or were manufacturing illegal weapons, and what did you learn? I, I interviewed numerous uh, former Davidian members. Right. And uh, I obtained... I'm interested in the neighbor. Tell us a little about the neighbor, since we had wanted him to come testify, Mr. Cervenka, yes. well, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Yes, sir, Mr. Cervenka. Cervenka. He's not allowed, so we'll have to rely on your testimony about Yes, sir. That. I initially received the information from Gene Barber, who was told by Mr. Cervenka that uh, he had heard machine gun fire throughout the evenings. And uh, thereafter, I personally interviewed Mr. Cervenka, who told me the same thing. Okay, thank you, Mr. Aguilera. At least I think the case has been made overwhelmingly that you met the appropriate standard in this warrant and uh, that we're getting some crocodile tears about it. My next uh, questions come from Mr. Johnston, who I must say has a reputation of being a fine prosecutor. How many years have you been a prosecutor? A little over 10 years, eight years in the past. How many system. search warrants have you reviewed? Several hundred. Okay. Did you feel that Special Agent Aguilera had done a decent, a good job on the investigation of violations in the firearms law at Davidian when you saw the warrant? I felt he'd done a very good job, and the affidavit itself, while he gave the information and drafted it, it was worked on by assistant U.S. attorneys, including me, and there's been a lot of talk today about the sexual abuse being in the affidavit. Yes, and I was going to ask you that. That, why? Was, that was my call. And why did you put it in there? For a number of reasons, primarily... A woman named Joy Sparks had given information. Yeah, we've heard about her. She was interviewed right. by a member of the Waco committee team named Miss Hagan. Uh, there was a, quite a bit of information, I think a page or more, about Joy Sparks and the information she'd received. In and of itself, it wasn't, it didn't say they had machine guns, but it demonstrated that they had uh, apparently had uh, weapons. They had, there was some threatening discussion by Koresh to her, uh, involving Miss Sparks. Further, there was evidence of a buried school bus that may act as a shooting range. At any rate, to explain to the magistrate why Ms. Sparks was there, I uh, made the decision to include in there why she was there. She was there to investigate allegations of sexual abuse of children. Uh, and the allegations of sexual abuse, in, in my mind, were referenced generally in the affidavit. Had I had I wanted to, had I wanted I, I, to... I don't mean to hurry up, but my 10 minutes okay. and i got a lot of other... Had, had I wanted to prejudice the, the, the affidavit and the warrant, I would have put in... I knew Kerry Jewell's story before the affidavit was, was drafted, and I would have put in all the details, the gory details about how he... what he did to her. I didn't want to prejudice a magistrate, but I did want to put the context of Ms. Sparks' visit. It was put in there to show why she was there and that she was there legitimately. There was evidence of sexual right. abuse. She, wasn't, she didn't drop out of the sky. Right. She had a good reason and to be there. And of course, and I think we haven't been, I mean, it's been pretty clear the warrant's okay, so I'm not going to bother you with many more questions, just reiterating the fact. Defense lawyers, very capable, didn't challenge. And furthermore, we found, and I'll get to that with Mr. Owen, we actually found violations of law you did on the uh, compound. But just one other quick answer. You also found some other things. I think some of those are the books that you have next to you. Would you just briefly, if you could, Mr. Johnson, explain 
what the, or let me ask you and then you can corroborate. As right. I understand it, those books explain how to make bombs and things like that and they were found on the compound. Right. These books were ordered and sent to uh, the Davidians. They, along with, in and of themselves, they might just be interesting reading, but they go with the materials they had. This one, which they had, these were introduced at trial, Congressman. Improved landmines. Im improvised landmines. Improvised their employment landmines. and destructive capabilities. Right. CIA field expedient methods for explosive right. preparation. Okay, et cetera, et cetera. Et we'll cetera. submit for the record all of the names. Anyway, there uh, I just would like to ask, those weren't making. being used as paperweights, were they, uh, when you uh, arrived, when you saw them? Were they, they? The things they had fit into the talk in the books. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Owen. Uh, and again, I apologize, all of these witnesses have put lots of their lives into this case, and it's sort of unfair to rush through, but I have so many points I want to make, I'm, I have to. And Mr. Johnston, I think you've done a, an excellent job on this case, and we very much appreciate it. Mr. Owen, um, would it be fair to say, and don't be modest, uh, that you're an expert on firearms? Yes, sir, I've been recognized in a, as an expert. Okay. Um, here is my question. Did you, you were on the scene, you identified guns from the compound. Could you tell us briefly about that? I was assigned to assist both the FBI and the Texas Rangers at the evidence collection point. This is how many days after the... Uh, uh, this was the day this search began. It was several days after the fire. Got it. Uh, could you identify any of those weapons uh, that you actually saw at the compound? Uh, yes, sir. In fact, the representative of the Texas Rangers has several they happen, weapons. They happen to have them here? Good. Could we, uh, could we see, could, could, could one of the Rangers please uh, show us one of the illegal weapons that were found at the uh, compound? The actual weapon is here. And you're from the Rangers, sir. We thank you for your help. Sergeant, Sergeant Jim Miller of the Rangers. Thank you, Sergeant. Could you just hold that up? To, oh, yes. Now, uh, Mr. Owen, do you have to go over there and examine them, or is it sufficient for you to see from here? Are those weapons that, could you name what they were? Could you hold that one up, please, sir? Stand uh, up, please. I, I need to see it a little bit closer. Go over, please. Yeah. And could the other gentleman just stand up so the committee can get some idea of, okay, now that one's obviously charred. Can you just tell us what these were and if you found them at the compound? This is a converted AR-15 type rifle manufactured by the... Converted means being made into an automatic. It gives I me every indication it's been modified due to the presence of a pivot pin hole that mounts an M16 automatic sear. Right. The barrel has been modified by drilling holes through the sides of it. A copper wool pad is wrapped around the barrel with an outer casing. Uh, this is very typical of sound suppressor or silencer construction. <clears throat> Thank you. And the other one, just briefly, is it the same? Just let me ask you, and you can answer. Is that a weapon illegal that you found at the compound? This is an AK-47 type rifle that has been converted to permit full automatic Making fire. it illegal? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Owen. And Mr. Aguilera, um, this is what you were afraid that you might find, I guess, when you put the warrant together. Yes, sir. Thank you. My final questions are for Dr. Perry, who, um, Dr. Perry, you interviewed the 21 children released from the compound during the standoff. Based on your team's interviews, what type of lifestyle were the children exposed to and how healthy was this? Did the children understand who their families were? I'm going to let you finish up. So I want to ask these uh, quickly. We, we worked extensively. We didn't just interview them. We basically lived with these kids for two months. We uh, had a large team of experts uh, uh, much, with much more expertise than the religious and the social right. apologists who have tried to um, make uh, this sound like it was a benign religious community. Um, I know of no religious sect that practices uh, grooming s children from the age of four and five to be sex objects of the leader. Um, we basically found... It almost found defiles the name of calling it a religion. Well, it, it actually is, Call I think, for many people who uh, are practicing Christians, it was, it's very offensive to suggest that engaging in sex with children is a legitimate part of our 
uh, belief right. system. And how about discipline? What did you find we about that? We found that the kids were inappropriately and excessively disciplined, physical discipline that was clearly abusive. We found a whole variety of other practices, which I've described in uh, my statement and the appendices, which I would like to have entered into the record, please. Without it. There's uh, the other thing that, that we that found yeah. was, and, so I, and I think that we can't really be any more, our, our conclusions were very independent of uh, the very compelling story of Kiri Jewell. Right. We received, we, we came to a very similar understanding of the belief system, the apocalyptic views, right. the, the sense that there was a willingness to engage in an abstract suicide, completely independent of any information from Kiri Jewell. Two other questions. My yes. colleague, Ms. Slaughter, in asking both Kiri and uh, Mr. Thibodeau questions, asked two things about paddling so yes. that the bottoms were black and blue of very, very young children. I think eight or nine months was mentioned. Did you find that to be the case? We Kids reported that, uh, and we found two of the children, and all of the children actually very openly spoke about being paddled with the helper. Uh, two of the children had physical lesions at the time of uh, release uh, after the shootout, uh, where they had, uh, initially they would not disclose what that was. Later on they told us that was from being paddled with the helper. Right. And second, the instance that was mentioned about putting a child, I think it was in a garage without... We, we heard that story mm -hmm. from the children. We also heard many other instances of uh, withholding food, of uh, physical isolation, of a whole variety of inappropriate... Right. And you heard techniques. this directly from we the children? We heard this directly from the children. So maybe Mr. Thibodeau didn't talk to enough well, people there. Well, I think there. that one thing that's very important to remember is that the men in the compound were kept and lived separately from the women and children. So uh -huh. Mr. Thibodeau's ability to make comments about the lives of the children, I think, is quite limited. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Mr. Perry. Um, I heard even Dr. you did a comparison of the children's heartbeats. Um, yes, we did. We, we were, one of the things that has been commented on in these hearings, and by many people who do not understand what happens to traumatized kids, is that just because they are compliant and they behave well, that there's the assumption that they are mentally healthy. Uh, I think that there's no way to predict in this room, because everybody has been essentially compliant, which one of us has been de is depressed, which person has had, is mourning the loss of a loved one, and so forth. Children are no different than adults in their ability to hide their inner feelings. When we examined these children and looked at their baseline heart rates, over the entire period of the two months that they, between the original shootout and the fire, we found that they were abnormally elevated. And this elevation was consistent with an internal sense of extreme distress, which right. was, uh, we believe, was And in conclusion, uh, you're, you're we just one quick yes or no. Two minutes. You're very generous. Yeah. I, I'm I was just wondering if the children could be characterized as traumatized. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ehrlich from Maryland for 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank everybody for appearing here today. Before I begin my questions, I'd just like to make a few points. I think they're important to make. Uh, the purpose of my questions is not to choose sides, certainly. It's, it's not to hold up anything. Uh, I'm bad on photo ops. It's certainly my, not my intent to put anyone on trial with respect to their careers, uh, nor is it my intent to put anything on trial including the NRA, including the Contract with America. I'm just keeping a list today. Uh, the BATF, the militias, the assault weapons ban, gun control generally. It's not even my intent to uh, put David Koresh on trial. I'm convinced David Koresh was a bad guy. He had sex with kids. He's a real bad guy. I'm just a freshman from Maryland, and I represent a couple hundred thousand people, and a fair percentage of those people have some legitimate questions about the way this whole thing was handled. And that's where I'm coming from. I know it's Washington. It's fun to spin. I'm, I'm interested in some facts, and I have some very specific questions for you all, and I really appreciate your answers today. My first question, uh, and, you, and uh, Mr. Johnson, you've touched on this uh, with respect to a question from Mr. Barr, and I wanted to develop it further. I, I believe you were asked whether or not you uh, had stated that during planning meetings with ATF, you would not support the search warrant for the Davidian Center unless the dynamic entry was utilized. I believe you uh, disagreed with that 
testimony, I believe that testimony came from the trial. Can you elaborate further, please? Yes, I, I disagree with it. It wasn't testimony at trial. It was an allegation by a defense attorney. And it was something that came up in court having to do with, it was out of the presence of the jury at, at any rate. It's been an allegation. There have been a number of allegations against me uh, like that. The other day someone said that I suggested they call an airstrikes on the compound and I put a tell the hunt shame. And uh, that's just as untrue, of course. But at any rate, I don't know about a pill of the hunt. Uh, at any rate, um, I was not involved in planning meetings with ATF as to the raid, only into the preparation of the search warrant. Uh, I did not tell them what kind of raid to do. I didn't know exactly what kind of raid they were going to do. I did know it involved cattle trailers. And I did know that it was uh, some kind of a ruse they were going to try to pull, you know, pull in under the the skies of cattle trailers. But I didn't know all the details, and that wasn't my function. And th thank you for that. Uh, th I, I asked a very specific question. I got a very specific answer, and I appreciate it very much. Uh, secondly, with respect to the whole military involvement, and Mr. Schumer developed this line of questioning, uh, you would all agree, I, I believe, that uh, aircraft from the National Guard uh, flashbangs, use of uh, flashbangs, uh, the MP5 rifles, etc. They're not specific to military type missions. Would that be generally agreed upon? Anybody want to answer that? Yes, sir, that's correct. They're not specific to military application. Now, now, sir, you would agree, however, that the use of Bradley fighting vehicles would be specific to a military mission, correct? Uh, my knowledge of the Bradley, it is a military vehicle, it's a combat vehicle. And, sir, at some point in time, uh, ATF made a request that was subsequently withdrawn with respect to, I believe, either seven or ten, I've, re I've read different versions of it, uh, a request for seven or ten Bradley fighting vehicles with respect to a proposed raid. Is that correct? I have absolutely no, no knowledge of that. Does anyone on the panel have any knowledge of that? I think there was an original request in our early planning for what we were going to do, we were talking about doing a siege. And at that time, there was a request that, that went forward. Sir, l let, me, let me just follow up. Uh, Mr. Serban? Yes. Uh, it's my understanding that there's no formal standard in law uh, by which the military defines a, a, a drug nexus. It's, it's my understanding that pursuant to law and regulations promulgated by Department of Defense or the Army, that there needs to be a drug nexus uh, allegation prior to military involvement. Is, is that correct? It's my understanding that, that, and you'll have to ask the military, which will, will be on, on later, that at the time that, that there was a nexus request. Now, they can supply certain things. If there's a, a nexus, then it depends on who would pay for it. Right, because if you get the military, if you prove the nexus, you get the military and it's free, correct? The military involvement is free. That is correct. Okay. Now, I guess with respect to Mr. Schumer's line of questioning, I, I'm, I'm confused because I understood the answers he received from the subsequent panel about, although he did not get into the Bradley fighting vehicles, the bottom line to his line of questioning was no military involvement, period. Yet I read in today's Washington Post that Ron Noble, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, made this statement, the kind of support that the ATF received from the military in this case was the kind of support you'd want them to receive. Lives were saved because of the assistance they received from the military. Now, I, I realize Mr. Noble's not here, but does anyone possibly know what, what assistance he's referring to? Uh, yes, uh, sir. I, I believe the assistance he's referring to there is probably uh, the medical train, emergency medical training that was provided by special forces to, uh, to ATF agents, to ATF medics in advance of the raid. We did document in the report acts of, uh, of sheer uh, heroism by the medics at ATF at the raid. They were trained by Army medics in, t uh, in uh, battlefield-like uh, uh, life-saving techniques, and so lives, were, lives were saved as a result of that. Sir, your answer is that that quote, to your understanding, I realize he's not here, you're only suggesting a possible answer, only refer to the military training, I'm sorry, the, the medical training 
and not training with respect to training for the actual raid on the compound? I obviously can't answer as to what Mr. Noble had in mind when he, when he made that quote. The life-saving uh, assistance provided by the military that I'm familiar with is the medical, uh, emergency medical assistance that was provided to ATF medics. Thank you. Uh, let me switch my line of, of inquiry here. Uh, it appears from everything that, that we've been informed uh, uh, concerning this raid that ATF at some point lost the element of secrecy. Uh, Koresh himself visited the, uh, and um, this is Mr. Tibero's uh, testimony from the earlier panel, visited his next door neighbors and stated that he believed that quote unquote college students were too old and had new cars and were probably FBI agents. Koresh complained to the local sheriff, the UPS delivery man was an undercover, undercover police officer. He did not appreciate being investigated. The Davidians visited their new neighbors. They were not uh, treated as new neighbors would be expected to have been treated, etc. Uh, my question really is, was there any thought prior to conducting this raid that the element of secrecy had been lost? The second part of that question is, if the answer is yes, why was the warrant attempted to be served according to the procedure which occurred? I'll let anyone answer that question. Sir, I'd like to have the opportunity to answer that question, and I certainly think it's appropriate if the representative from ATF uh, does as well. Uh, those were really the central questions that uh, we addressed in the Treasury Review uh, two years ago, and, and a good portion of our report was devoted to uh, examining those questions and offering Mr. answers. Can I just, I, I will come back to you. Okay. I will come back to you, and I understand your role here. I would like the ATF agents present to answer the question, and then Certainly. I'll get back to you. <clears throat> With uh, respect to the element of surprise. Yes, uh, sir. <clears throat> on February the 1st, uh, a decision was made, and I'm sad to say I was a part of that decision, to entrust the news media at the Waco Tribune Herald with certain information about our investigation. And that was because they continued to make contact with folks in the U.S. Attorney's Office and other law enforcement agencies with the threat to break a series of articles about the Branch Davidians that they had been working on for a long period of time. We met with Barbara Elmore, who I believe was a managing editor at that time. When I say we, Mr. Sarabin and I, and we asked if we could speak with her off the record and she agreed we explained to her that we had a very sensitive investigation going on and that an untimely breaking of the news about the Branch Davidians uh, would certainly uh, hamper the success of, of a, any search warrant that might come about and could and probably would put the safety, if not the lives, of both federal agents and those occupants of the compound into jeopardy. Ms. Elmore said in response that she wasn't going to make any promises that she would talk to her uh, supervisors at the paper and would let us know at a later time. Not to belabor this or take it too far, but on the Wednesday prior to the warrant being executed, in the afternoon at about 3 o'clock, Mr. Hanowski met with members of the Waco news media, newspaper specifically, at their offices, and as he began his uh, statement of appreciation for their cooperation, he was immediately interrupted by one of the supervisors there and was told that he wanted... The newsman said, I want it clearly understood 
that this newspaper is not cooperating with law enforcement in any shape or form. Our search was planned for March the 1st. We were notified after that meeting with Mr. Hanowski and the news media that they intended to break their lead article on February the 28th, Sunday. We set in motion activities to back the date of the warrant execution up to Sunday, hoping that we could at least execute the warrant on the same day that the lead article came out. And then we were notified, uh, after having made those arrangements, uh, that the uh, newspaper decided they would break their lead article on Saturday, which they did. When the raid team arrived at the compound, there was news media personnel all over the area already, one of whom had been contacted by David Jones, and he, the newsman, tells David Jones, you better get out of here, ATF's fixing to raise this place. Now, when we talk about element of surprise, is, is the element of surprise lost when the first article comes out, or is the element of surprise lost and we were unaware that the news person had told David Jones that until afterwards? It, sir, At, if I can cut you off for a second, I realize I'm running short of time. Is it your testimony that the press awaited you all when you arrived at the compound to conduct the raid? Yes, sir. Did that give you any hint that the element of secrecy may have been compromised? We did not recognize them as the press as we were coming, as the raid team was coming in. They didn't recognize them as the press at the time. Okay, sir, let me ask you this question. Besides the formal, besides the formal avenue of the press, did any of the other testimony produced here today or any other facts come to your attention that would have raised a question in your mind as to whether the element of secrecy had been compromised at any point prior to the raid? If you, when we talk about the element of secrecy as opposed to the element of surprise, the element of secret, secrecy um, about our raid, we didn't feel was compromised at that point. Okay, so your testimony is that you all believed, and I'm just trying to get your, your viewpoint here. Yes, sir. Prior to that raid, 10 seconds prior to the beginning of that raid, you did not feel as though the element of secrecy or surprise had been compromised. Is that correct? No, that's not correct, sir. 10 seconds prior to the raid, I feel like the secrecy was lost at that point. Okay. Your time has expired. Thank you. I'll have an opportunity to follow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're going to have to recess. I believe there are two votes. Uh, if you'll be patient. We appreciate that. And uh, we'll be back uh, five minutes after the second vote. Absolutely. We'll continue with the Waco investigation in a moment. But first, some program information. Sunday night on Book Notes. In 1979, Newt Gingrich was a freshman on Capitol Hill. This weekend, the House Speaker talks about the people in his political career. Joe Gaylord is a remarkable student of American politics who was the Iowa State Republican Party Executive Director. Then he came to the Republican National Committee and was the state, the national director for state legislatures in 1980 when we picked up 700 seats. Then he went to the Congressional Campaign Committee and ultimately became the director of it and uh, was in charge of designing the 84, 86, and 88 campaigns, and then became a consultant. He is uh, one of my closest personal friends, and he is a uh, man whose judgment I regard as uh, extraordinarily good overall. I mean, just has a remarkable ability uh, to, to know what not to do and to know where the landmines are in American politics. In uh, June of last year, he wrote a paper that described 231 seats. 224 by winning and 7 by switching. We ended up at 230 by winning and now 2 by switching, so we're one ahead of his goal. Uh, we then executed that paper, and in September, and I think it's September 17th or 18th, it's in the book, we got on an airplane, and we were going to have a planning meeting, and I said, are we planning for speaker or for minority leader? 
and he just said very bluntly, you better be planning for Speaker because that's what you're going to be. Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich and his book, To Renew America, on the next Book Notes, Sunday night at 8 Eastern and Pacific Time. We now continue with the Waco investigation, the first day of hearings before House Joint Subcommittee. Chairing the hearing, Republican Bill Zellif of New Hampshire and Republican Bill McCollum of Florida. Subcommittees will come to order. Uh, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Brewster, has 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As one who happens to believe that uh, ATF and FBI do an awful lot right, uh, probably 90, 95 percent of your cases uh, are never heard of by the media or by the average American. Uh, my main interest in this is trying to figure out uh, what went wrong in the deal. Uh, I think that uh, some of my colleagues here are attempting to play a 